OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. And a very good morning to you this Monday morning. We are definitely bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and we welcome you to the start of another amazing sporting week. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number if you want to get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave a comment on the YouTube stream if there's anything we're not covering today that you'd like us to cover. Well, we're very sorry, because there's too much to cover. There was too much sport over the weekend, and it's a brilliant complaint to have after such a long period of time. And uh, we're going to get into almost all of it over the course of the next two and a half hours. Owen Sheen is here. Owen, good morning to you. Morning, Ger. How are things? Good, yeah. Um, I mean, a pretty amazing, unforgettable, horrific at times, and then at the end, are we all happy that everything worked out okay? Is, that, is, is Christian Eriksen surviving this? I'd, I'd love to see some, I'd love to see him talking from his hospital bed at this point, just so we can all kind of go, okay, yeah, great. The, the doubting Thomases amongst us are like, yeah, like, I'm sure that all the news coming through is very positive, but you just would love to see kind of uh, some grainy, handheld in not in portrait uh, video footage of him chatting away uh, just to give us all that sense of comfort that his recovery is complete yeah and, and it obviously won't be complete but that you know the danger has passed and and that's it and that, like in, in fairness i do think that for a story like this the volume of information that's actually come out in the space of even 24 hours so up until yesterday had actually been quite remarkable that you kind of felt that you had a good idea of where things were at yesterday obviously most of the, the Danish squad came out and, and did press yesterday. The manager came out. A couple of the players, I think, were speaking, maybe more after the game on Saturday. And then, obviously, one of the doctors spoke yesterday as well, which was um, just still this, this harrowing experience, watching somebody who was right in the front line of this thing speak about how they essentially saved a man's life and how this turned on its head from a disaster, uh, a phrase that we use quite often with regards to sporting events that involve, involve a heavy defeat. Uh, but no, this was something that was an actual disaster that was about to happen and which turned on its head as a result of incredible work, incredible quick thinking by his teammates, incredible work by the medical professionals. And as you point out now, all of a sudden this story is relatively positive from the, the, the standpoint of where we were on, on Saturday afternoon because this was just horrifying. The, the, the worst possible outcome just came so close by the looks of things. The, the uh, miracle of science is something I think that we should never get complacent about either. Like the, the fact that your chances of survival go from like 7% to 70% if there's a defibrillator around and the defibrillator is used properly is, is fairly remarkable. But Conor Gormley is in the star today talking about a fairly similar incident that um, he had with his dad at a match. I, I didn't know anything about this, I, um, maybe I did at the time, but um, so he's talking about his father, Sean, receiving life-saving treatment at a game against Ardoin on, in 2018. So three years ago, at a, a normal club league game on a Friday evening, at halftime he was coming out and one of the managers came over to him and told him that his dad had collapsed in the stands. He wasn't responding, it was very stressful. Luckily enough, there were nurses and medical, medically minded people in the stands. They got the defibrillator out and got it on and it took over from there and thankfully they have a lucky story. It's like, it is absolutely remarkable that uh, this, this exists, you know? I mean, I, I think that we kind of forget sometimes how lives are being saved and just how important it is that everybody goes and learns CPR and, uh, and then you started to hear of other people who have like used CPR in the past and saved people's lives on the basis of that uh, Bee Gees, Finney Jones ad from a couple of years ago. It's as simple as that, like, yeah. you know, like watching a YouTube video might actually help save somebody's life. We should probably just take the three minutes to get out of the normal YouTube wormhole you're in, watch that video and go, yeah, okay, that's it, I'm, I'm good now, and I'm, I'm gonna be able to step forward and, and help and uh, do my bit here. Th look, we're gonna talk about the whole handling of it in a couple of minutes' time. We're gonna go to Denmark to see exactly, um, or to remember the Danish press was at the game, to see exactly what they think now in the aftermath of it. So there's loads of other bits to un untangle, but sometimes we just need to take a step back and go, Wow, humankind and uh, the, the majesty of science is mm. something, particularly when there's people out there not taking vaccines, uh, particularly when there's people out there questioning the value of science. You're like, hang on a second, this is, this is the best part. Uh, and, uh, like by all accounts as well, there was some chatter around that with regards to Ericsson, like some nonsense being flouted, which I, I hadn't even uh, seen until I saw somebody co coming online yesterday saying, shut up. I mean, you, nobody knows what they're talking about with regards to, to, to Ericsson at the moment. But as you say there, the the, the miracle of science, the, the skill that these professionals have that work in professional football teams as well is absolutely 
So it, it's just something we just do not appreciate because it is very much a do your job. You are, you've got uh, letters after your name, you are smart, well done sort of thing. But this is actually where it's like, holy crap, you, you've saved somebody's life. The, the, the expertise that they can bring to the table is, is out of this world. And like, I mean, the, the, the kind of really scary situation with regards to this is that how close this came to being a disaster despite the fact that it was almost in the conditions that were best placed for him to pull through, which was at a stadium with professionals on hand. As you say, every minute is so important. If this happens on the training ground, there are, are certain, are, are certain uh, procedures in place, but they probably are in a professional setting. If it happens outside of that setting, obviously not. So for this to happen in that sort of setting, that, that is the one positive you can take from this, or the, or, or the one lucky break that, that, that did come his way. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock. We're going to talk about the performance rankings, uh, a Euros special. Euro 2021. Let's just call it Euro 2021, right? Christian Eriksen is going to have that conversation at 7.50. David Myler at 8. Paddy Andrews is going to join us at 20 past 8. Uh, there's some fairly significant developments in the world of getting football over the course of the weekend. Grode Hegarty is going to join us live at 8.45, the hurler of the year. Alan Quillen at 9. Ron Garris, look back where, uh, you know, it turns out that sometimes evil does triumph. And uh, GA reaction from half nine uh, around the grounds as well. A really interesting weekend of GA in some aspects and not much new learned in others. We'll detail that between um, Paddy Andrews and the post-match reaction at half nine. As we said, we'd love to hear from you. 87 180 180 or leave a comment on the YouTube stream. Time for the performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is, was just lacked that intensity. Euros all the way? Euros all the way this morning. The good, the bad, the grand, as ever on our performance rankings. One place to start. We'll, we will chat football in, in just a moment. But we will start with the, the Christian Eriksen situation here. And it is incredibly harsh to put anybody into the red after Saturday because it was like this truly unprecedented thing that nobody can ever be fully prepared for. I think everybody working in the media, everybody working as a professional at the game on Saturday was thrown into a complete state of chaos, a complete state that nobody can ever be prepared for. But there is one element of this thing which is pissing a lot of people off and doesn't look great a couple of days out from this. And it is the decision to continue the game on Saturday night. The option was given to the Danish and Finnish players on Saturday, as we now know, to resume the game that night or to come back on Sunday morning and play the game at 12 o'clock midday. They were the two options given to Denmark and to Finland from a number of different accounts at this point, we've been told this, by UEFA. And yet, this tweet went up on Saturday night from UEFA. Following the request made by players of both teams, UEFA has agreed to restart the match between Denmark and Finland tonight at half past eight. Now, I'm not sure about you, but if you have no other context and you see that tweet, you are certainly thinking to yourself, all right, Denmark and Finland have said, no, 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 we don't care about all the different options you've given us, UEFA. We want to get this thing done tonight, which is just not the case whatsoever. That tweet just completely, and there is a thread, there are a number of different replies to it from UEFA, fails to mention that there was only one alternative provided to them other than finishing the game on Saturday night, and that was to come back on Sunday and finish the game at 12 o'clock, which was a similarly ridiculous notion. The idea that you'd have to probably get up at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning in order to, to get to the stadium, it, it was just a, a non-starter. It was the lesser of two evils, not this sort of decision that they came to UEFA with, as that tweet points out. And really, it's... Yeah, like, I mean, you, you could be playing that game today, you could be playing that game tomorrow. They don't play again until Thursday, I think it is. The reaction, as you can imagine, hasn't gone down well in, in Denmark, for example. Peter Schmeichel said something terrible happens and UEFA gives the player an option to go out and play the game the last 55 minutes or come back at 12 o'clock. I mean, what kind of option is that? That was what Peter Schmeichel said. Michael Laudrup was critical as well. He said, you have to make a decision so soon after a big emotional event, and that, I believe, is wrong. UEFA should have just said, we won't play more tonight, of course, and then we will look at what possibilities we have. If you look at people closer to the team, Kasper Hjulmand, after the game, said, we knew we had two options. The players couldn't imagine not being able to sleep tonight and then having to get on the bus and come in again tomorrow. Honestly, it was best to get it over with. But then he did a press event yesterday and he said, no, nah, we should not have played. He, he clearly had just kind of come to his 
had a come to a greater realisation on, on Sunday. He said, we'll try tomorrow to establish normality as much as possible. Players have different reactions to shocks and trauma. And then Morton Boson, the, one of the heroic doctors, said, I don't think the right decision was made to play the game. We have had help from a psychological point of view at the hotel last night. Everyone expressed their feelings and how they saw the situation and everyone was pleased we talked it through. It is bonkers that this game is in the books and that we've actually seen this game resume and that that game actually happened. It, it is crazy to think that, that this thing occurred, but it did. And if you are going to pick one area of criticism after Saturday, for me it has to, has to rest with UEFA for that. Like, I, I mean, I agree to a point. I also feel like almost any decision UEFA make in a scenario like this is going to end up being heavily criticised. Maybe the decision to play it the next day was the one that wouldn't have been, but they, didn't they say that they couldn't at that stage get their heads around going home, not sleeping, and then coming back the next morning at 12? Like, ultimately, if, if the penalty goes in and it's a one-all draw, everybody thinks, OK, actually, in a way, that's fair. That was kind of a... I, I almost thought that there would be some kind of gentleman's agreement that this was going to play out as a nil-all draw after what had happened, but that obviously didn't happen. So, look, I, I think that um, I see a lot of people very angry about a lot of things, and, Jesus, it's just very hard to be very angry about a lot of stuff when Ericsson nearly died and then they saved him, and it's like, what do we do now? Because, as the, the director was in, speaking in the keep saying, there's no handbook for this. There is no handbook. I, you know, uh, we, we tried not to be... Uh, creepy, we tried not to be, and they were a little bit creepy, but like again, y you know, the whole world wants to see what's happening, and if they'd cut back to studio, everybody would have gone, ooh, does that mean, does that mean Christian Eriksen has just died and they can't show us this anymore? What's happening? And so into that vacuum, all of a sudden social media pours, and I, like, you're, you are damned if you do and damned if you don't, and I understand that they definitely crossed lines at various stages, but to be super critical of anybody in the moment when this is unfolding is very difficult. I agree with that to, to a point as well. I do think, though, that there is an element to this UEFA conversation that that had that just doesn't sit well with me whatsoever. That like nobody knows how to handle this thing, but it seemed that there was a, almost a decision made that you have option A and you have option B, and that they were your you were restricted in in, in those decisions. Why wasn't there a third option? Why wasn't there a decision to to come back tomorrow morning and and talk about it rather than come back tomorrow? And play the game because like, the game needs to get played. Like, like, no. So what is your option C now? It's you in the moment right now. What can you come up with? Like two days later with that third option, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard, but Monday, Tuesday was an option. Like, w w uh, is it? Well, I mean, if Sunday was going to be an option, would Monday, Tuesday not be an option? Well, as well? Then the knock-on impact and everything else, and somebody ends up being in a better position because they know the result or they don't know the result. It, look. I'm, I'm sure there was an alternative, and if the game had been postponed because of a, a terror attack or if the game, there must have been some contingency plans in place. But um, so whatever those contingency plans must have been discussed in advance. That's the whole point of having big committees to do this stuff. It's just uh, I, look, I agree with you. It's just it's very hard to find a solution that's going to make the tournament continue. And again, the, the importance of the tournament versus a man's life, and and the horror of everybody watching that. Uh, and the duty of care in the players that have witnessed this as well is, is what it boils down to, uh, which is a hugely important point. Like this was, like we, we hold up sports people as these demigods sometimes, these, these people who, like I, I find it incomprehensible sometimes that I'm even older than some of these players. And it just feels like they're on a completely different plane of existence to all of us because they're professional athletes and they're so incredibly good at what they do. They do things that you or I could never dream of doing. And to see them standing there like that on Saturday completely helpless as their friend was yeah. about to die or uh, was just being brought back from that. Like, is this and then go out and play unspeakably again. tragic thing for them to go through and then for them to have to, to go through it again that evening? I, I just think that maybe you can take away the idea of who knows what's happened in a game a little bit. And that goes for even the final match day in a group. Like, surely you could forego that a little bit to, to, to allow a, a greater scope of possibilities. I don't know. Again, I, I am with you in the whole idea that it's very hard to be too critical when everybody is involved in this sphere of just the unprecedented, the, the unknown. And there is, like, there, there, I'm sure there were... I actually didn't see the, the, the full television coverage live as it was happening. I didn't see the, the scenes of, of Christian Eriksen's wife Thankfully, I think, um, and I'm sure that decision is something that is going to be the one that gets a lot, the, the most criticism after the, the course of the weekend because that really does feel like a, a deliberate 
thing that the cameraman has to get into position and the director has to cut to, to that shot and that that for me doesn't sit, sit easy either but there are a number of other f factors at play here which they're not accidental but they are as a result of people and professionals being thrown into a, a situation that nobody can ever prepare you for. All right. I do want to remind everybody, of course, this is the Gillette Performance Rankings and we do them every mo every Monday here on OTB AM. The point of this is to give you an opportunity to get involved and to give you a chance to win the Gillette Starter Pack. All you've got to do is let us know who you would put in the good, the bad and the grand in our rankings. We'll pick a winner before the end of the show this morning and we'll announce it around about half past nine. So let's fly through the rest of these because obviously that um, was the most important thing that happened over the course of the weekend and I, I can definitely see the point of um, putting you away from the red. I think that I definitely have... Uh, for the point you're making about the players being human, the people making these decisions are also under in intense stress as well. So let's move on to the uh, the soap opera that is the football itself. <laughs> uh, France in the red. Uh, Le bif est vrai, I think is uh, the phrase we're looking for this morning, Ger. This might actually become a running segment here on OTBAM over the course of the next few days and the next few weeks as we look to pick holes in this all-too-perfect French squad. And it seems that Didier Deschamps has done his bit to allow us to find a few holes to pick. The pre-season, pre-competition friendly with Bulgaria seems to have sparked a bit of tension in the French squad. Uh, we were speaking about this last Friday on the show. Uh, Karen Benzema was replaced by Olivier Giroud. Olivier Giroud scores two goals, but he was helped not once by Kylian Mbappe to score those two goals. In fact, he did it in spite of Kylian Mbappe's existence, not because of Kylian Mbappe's existence on the pitch. Olivier Giroud came out afterwards and said, I was quiet because sometimes you make a run and the balls just don't arrive. I don't always pretend to make the right calls, but I've tried hard to give solutions in the area. He basically saying that uh, Kylian Mbappe wouldn't pass him the ball, but he was pretty happy to pass the ball to Karim Benzema when he was on the pitch. Now, Mbappe was said to be quite unhappy with this at the time, he wanted to go out and do a press conference and address this head on and was denied that request. However, that changed over the course of the weekend. On Sunday, he was allowed to do his media and he said he'd been a little affected by Giroud's comments. What he said does not bother me. He expresses a feeling when he speaks. I'm a forward and I've had that feeling 365 times in a game when you feel like you are not being served. It's more about releasing it publicly. I saw him in the dressing room. I congratulated him on his goals. He didn't say anything to me. I heard about it in the press. That's more important than what he said. He didn't say anything bad. So this is what's pissed Kylian Mbappe off. This is, uh, it, it's not what he said, it's how he said it. He went to the press, he didn't come to me first. He was happy and behind my back, he went on Le Keep TV and he has uh, stirred the pot. In a pot that doesn't need stirring, we are the world champions. But uh, there is a, a little bit of beef creeping into this French dressing room. Okay, that's real. That is real. You can't, be, you, you can't put that back in, right? No, and the interesting thing is that Karim Benzema is an injury doubt for tomorrow night's game against Germany. So we could have... Giroud and Mbappe leading the line for the first game of the Euros against the Germany team who let's not forget we painted last week as the potential the, 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 they have the potential to upset the apple cart a little bit in this group where Portugal and France are seen as a top two but the, the pesky Germans could come along and, and really upset that and I think the French are doing quite a bit to, to upset themselves uh, Giroud is five off Henri's record of goals by the way that's going to be something that he's going to be looking to eclipse during the course of this tournament that is something I get the feeling that just annoys Benzema quite a bit and I wouldn't be surprised if Benzema's return to the squad is instrumental in some way to the tone of all of this. Like he's obviously described uh, Giroud as, as a go-kart compared to Benzema's Formula 1 car a couple of years ago. <laughs> and like I, I just think that he sees Giroud as this big, lumbering, effective goal scorer, but Benzema sees himself as the, the classy individual up front who is on a level above Giroud. So he is, though. He is like it's he facts. Is right. Facts be facts. There's nothing you can do about that. Like uh, he is absolutely a better footballer. He's had a much better career. He's been far more successful. He doesn't have a World Cup winners medal. But uh, look, okay. So that's France. France has uh, a proper beef going on at the moment, and they are in the red. Why are England only in amber for you this week? Well, okay. So you can see the Netherlands coming up in green, and England in the amber. That makes no sense. Of course it doesn't. I mean, if you're doing a power rankings of teams, of course England will be ahead of Netherlands in the in in the race. For this trophy. We'll get to the Netherlands in just a moment, but the expectation for England is different to that of the Netherlands. The, while England have done brilliant work in downplaying expectations over the course of the last two tournaments, Gareth Southgate, this brilliant statesman, all these players incredibly likeable and uh, have, have done nothing in the way of actually trying to, to big up their expectations or, or to be arrogant a la past England teams. 
But if they crash out of the last 16 in a tournament, which is effectively a home tournament, I think that is a disappointing outcome for this group of England players. So did you see anything yesterday against Croatia in their 1-0 win that would suggest that they could beat Portugal or France in the last 16? And I'm not sure we did. I think that we saw magnificent performances from the likes of Belgium and Italy. And yes, Croatia are probably better than Russia or Turkey. In fact, they're definitely better than yeah. Turkey or Russia. But They were in the last World Cup final. They were. They've had a heap of retirements since then. They were awful yesterday. And England were Grand. I thought England were really good. I think I think that we were definitely underrating. I think for, I still think he hasn't got the team right. That that's my main thing. And I, I actually the, the whole Raheem Sterling did he justify his selection because he scored the goal? Oh, he looked so dangerous. I'm not sure he looked that dangerous. I've got to say, and I don't think obviously Harry Kane didn't have a good game. However, when he accidentally sticks Jack Grealish in the team at some point, they're going to explode into this tournament. And I think that they controlled the game in a way that I haven't seen an England team control the game. I thought they were confident in their passing. I thought they were aggressive. They, they just, their, their forward unit did not create as many chances as you would expect. To. And yet, having said that, the Phil Foden chance that uh, comes up back uh, off the upright and the Harry Kane chance where you would actually have expected him to bust a gut to get to that at the far post and nod it in. I think that they could have won that game 3-0 and that would have been an accurate reflection of the quality of the performance they put in. And so I'm not having this, on. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not having like this. I, mean... I think that England, England played really well yesterday and I don't know, I don't know what, what you've got to take off what layers of post-colonial inferiority complex are, are pushing down in you to prevent you from saying that was a good performance from England. They were good. How many goals could they have been up against Iceland, for example, before the whole thing collapsed five years ago? Like, this is... The, what uh, happened this, since this, then? This is the narrative is that they reached a World Cup semi-final. Yeah, and I'm sure that there were people saying that they could have won that game on a, on a different night as well. Like, I mean... But they the, won the, last night. The, They've got this incredible array of talent. They do. Who are starting to have a bit of confidence. And, like, in fairness, this is a group of players that are, uh, uh, like, uh, on a mental level, on a level above the 2000s England team. We, we know that. It's just the quality of the performance yesterday was grand. And we're putting them in the grand this morning. We're not okay. putting them in the bad. We're not putting them okay. in the good. They were fine. Like, Calvin Phillips looks like uh, just a perfect person to, to be marshalling this midfield and he's almost your first name in the team sheet like I mean Jordan Henderson if he was fully fit might have had that position and actually Calvin Phillips is maybe a more effective midfielder in this team Jude Bellingham when he came on is the youngest ever European player and looked quite at home yeah. they've got their first ever win in the, fir at for yes, at the first time of asking that's why, Euros. That's why I that, think that like positive but is this a team that we can be confident is going to beat France or Portugal in the last 16? I think not, and I think that that will be a disappointing outcome if they lose that last 16. Now, the thing is, they've got their hardest game out of, out of the way now. Scotland and, and Czech Republic, they get one point from those last two games they qualify, and like that's it. So the, the whole thing is almost done with a, with a first-round win against the, the second seeds in the group. So they, can put the feet, they won't put the feet up, but they can if they want to over the next couple of games, and they will be fine in, in the context of this group. But I, I think the bar for England is so high, given, as you say, the quality of players in this squad, because it is an outstanding squad. Yeah. Look, I think there's a very good chance that England are the next World Cup winners and that we're watching a team who are cresting towards Qatar next year as a team who can... Bear in mind, it's, it's 18 months between now and the World Cup final. It's yeah. cri Christmas week uh, next year is the World Cup final. And that group of players is only going to get better and understand. I still just feel like they're a bit trapped in the old... Uh, formations and uh, look I don't know we'll see we'll see exactly how, how well they develop I wonder I was thinking what would Pep Guardiola's England team be from that squad and how different would it be and what would it look like uh, I think that's an interesting thought experience that we might come back to later on in the week yeah like playing Kieran Trippi at left back is the exact sort of thing that Pep Guardiola would do in a Champions League final for example so I well I think that Pep Guardiola might do it across the course of the season and Trippi would step into midfield but it might not be Trippi I think it would be somebody else and I certainly don't think he'd be playing two centre backs uh, I don't think he would have played two centre-backs yesterday. Maybe he would against Croatia. Mm. But uh, anyway, look, let's go on. The good. Let's uh, start here with uh, the Netherlands, actually, because I've already mentioned them. Like, we, we could put Belgium in here, like, but I think we're going to have like, plenty of time to talk about Belgium at different points during this tournament. They're going to go deep into this thing. Uh, I'm putting the Netherlands in here because the Netherlands have had their best player injured for quite some time. They, they've lost Ronald Koeman quite some time ago, and they've got used to the fact that Frank de Boer is their manager for quite some time at the moment. So they realise they're not going to win this tournament for quite some time. And they have this beautiful freedom about them that comes with knowing that they're not going to win a tournament but still being pretty good at football. 
And then the exhibition last night we see was evidence of that, that, yeah, they went 2-0 up against Ukraine, but this is the new Netherlands. This is the post-Van Dijk, post-Ronald Koeman Netherlands. This is a team that will let you down. This is a team that will concede twice, but then score a stunning winner to, to put themselves back ahead. This is going to be the most fun team to watch at this year's competition, bar none. This brilliant contrast of orange and blue jerseys on show last night was just part of the best clash we've had so far in this competition. And I also want to mention the fact that the Amsterdam Arena is just this brilliant, visually pleasing thing, it, it turns out. And one of the things that's also extremely visually pleasing is the semi-full stadium. So this is something that we haven't got too used to because we've been used to empty stadiums or full stadiums. But I love the half-full stadium because the director will pan to the crowd and there will be a fan celebrating a goal. But if you're in a packed stadium, you almost know what you have to do. You put your arms around the person beside you and you jump up and down in that little micro spot that you've got to yourself. But in this tournament, you've got like four or five seats either side of you. You go into full freestyle mode. You can pop a move, you can fist pump towards the sky, you can get your phone out. You've got so many more options to, to celebrate a goal or to celebrate a moment. And we're seeing these great moments of performance art from different supporters around the ground. And it was just at its best yesterday in, uh, in the Cruyff Arena where you had this uh, Netherlands fan who didn't really know what to do with himself and the Ukraine equalised. So he just marched across the aisle shook a Ukraine fan's hand and, and walked back to his seat. So the, the, these are all the different elements you get with the Netherlands at the moment and everybody should be wanting them to, to go as far as they can in this tournament. They'll be on a relatively forgiving side of the draw when they top this group. They're not going to win this thing, but I think they know that themselves and they're a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's make or break for uh, De Boer's managerial career. We're going to skip Italy for now because they are in your green, but we're going to talk about that in one second with uh, David Miner. So that is your performance rankings for this week. If you disagree, agree, or if you've got your own thoughts on our Euro performance rankings and we'd love to hear from you because we've got a Gillette starter pack to give away all you got to do is let us know who would you put in the good the bad or the grand on our rankings that is it for Monday's Gillette performance rankings OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette David Miner good morning to you how are you good morning lads how are we let's start with England right Owen is putting them in the ah it was grand uh, level of performance I thought they were a bit better than that I thought they were pretty good Considering their track record of never having won an opening tournament game in the Euros, considering all the stuff that they'd had to deal with in the build-up, considering all the, the talk about whether or not they were going to take the knee and they were going to take the knee and all that kind of stuff that happened, and the fact that they're at home, I thought that was a very composed performance where they controlled the ball and weren't in any threat at any, under any threat at any point from a reasonable Croatia side. No, I agree with you. Um, I think it was a very professional performance. Um, obviously, look... We've been, everybody across Ireland, England has been trying to guess what, you know, Gareth Southgate's start 11 was going to be. And then we see the team sheet. You hear it's been leaked a few hours before. You see Trippier's at left back, Sterling starting. You know, Calvin Phillips is in midfield. You're kind of, so many question marks are raised, but their performance was, I wouldn't say it was brilliant. But it was very good. They were very professional. Um, you know, their probably best period was the first 20 minutes when they kind of got on the ball. They dominated possession. They looked to create chances, of course. Phil Foden had that chance to hit the post. But throughout the game, they looked... I've not seen England play like that in many major tournaments, kind of, you know, where they're controlled and they try to dictate the pace, you know, from start to finish. Of course, Croatia was always going to get some momentum, get back into it. But like you said there, Croatia can never really look like scoring until probably the last 10 or 15 minutes when they were throwing everything to get an equaliser. It was a very, very professional performance. And of course, look, a lot of question marks over selection. Oh, he was justified because in, inevitably, you know, Trippier had a good game, albeit I'd want to see a lot more from him going forward because I think he has that in the locker. Alvin Phillips is exceptional in midfield, probably man of the match. Or Sterling gets the goal, which inevitably wins them the game. Uh, Trippier's throw-in was a bit like uh, Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady at one stage where he, he, he threw he threw Raheem Sterling open for to create a chance at the edge of the box. I haven't seen that before. Is that... I saw somebody saying that's a worked-on move in training. Is that a worked-on move in training, or is that just a fluky, brilliant throw-in? Definitely. Um, if, look, it's it's like anything, you know, Jar. If you have players with certain capabilities, like a long throw, it's stuff you're going to work on. Um, I think I watched a lot of England in you know their warm-up friendly games against Austria mainly, where you know, watching Harry Kane, that he's going to come short. So you know that you're going to need wingers that are going to run behind. Phil Foden didn't do a lot of it yesterday, but Sterling did. That's probably when we see Raheem at his best. So it's going to be something that they've looked at. Can we get, how can we get, you know, Sterling running in behind? If it comes from a throw-in, you, you, something you will work on. There'll be little, little two or three movements, kind of get him going and then create space for him. 
But when you've got someone with his pace, and like you said, if he's got a long throw, then it's going to be something they'll work on. Because, you know, the, the Arsene Wenger used to go on about it. You know, he's he's often advocated to change throw-ins that it should nearly be kicked in because there's some crazy stat that I think it's like 80% of the time you actually lose possession uh, from throwing. So it will be something that England will look at. So kids, you know, brought in striker specialists, set-piece specialists. Um, of course, we all know Liverpool have a throw-in specialist. So it will be something they've worked on. The, I, I sometimes find, David, when it comes to England at a major tournament, they go into these early games and they do look excellent early in a tournament. And I mean early in a, in a first game of a tournament and a strange moment happens where there is a relatively unheard of striker who can just put the ball in the back of the net in a, in a poxy manner and all of a sudden England don't come away with the early result that they should come away with at a major tournament. So do they deserve credit for Croatia not getting a poxy chance yesterday because it just seemed that Croatia were, were so average yesterday but I presume there'll be people making a case today that England deserve credit for, for how average they looked. Yeah. Um, no, Croatia, I was expecting a lot more. Obviously their team is ageing. You know, Brozovic, Modric, they're both you know, old. Um, I expect a lot more from them. But you've got to give credit to England in the way in which they dealt with them. You know, they, they tried to control the game. They kept the ball. Um, they limited them. Like, of course, there's been the question mark over Harry Maguire's fitness, whether or not he would you know, be fit and available. Obviously, coming back into trend the last few days, I know people would have said there's no chance he could have played, but you're kind of the main centre-back. You know, you kind of put your hand up to say, I want to play. So kids obviously made the tough decision to go with Mings um, and Stones, but Mings was a very poor for the standards he set for himself this season um, in the warm-up games. I thought he was really solid. Um, him and Stones you know, dealt with everything that came their way. So you've got to take, like, you can look at the positives on it. England going into the first game, they win 1-0. You get the three points on the board. Um, like George said, there's the first game they've won the European Championship or first opening game they've won. And they keep a clean sheet. So there's a lot of positives for them to take. Look, they've got three points of the board going into the Scotland game. I know they play today, but... It's a case of they've got momentum and, you know, there's a feel-good factor around that change room now. Well, the, the momentum thing is going to be interesting, David, because is that the midfield three then that you just persist with and, and allow them to build up that cohesion over the next little while and just don't touch it because they've already built up this, this winning habit now? That's, you know, Owen, that's the million-dollar question. Um, before, before the, you know, the kickoff uh, against Croatia, everyone expected Grealish to start. Um he is the maverick. He, he is someone who's capable of doing something, you know, and he's not gone with him. Um, he didn't even bring him on, but you expect Grealish to have some significant role. Of course, you know, Trippier playing left back, will he continue with that? Obviously, it's, 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 it's a long tournament, but it's like at the same time, you know, those 11 who have played, they put in a really good performance. They've beaten Croatia, obviously beat them in 2018. It's, it's very hard to change, you know, a winning team. So it's going to be it's going to be really interesting to see what Garrett does do going forward because, like you said, his team is won. There's good players on the bench that we, we probably would have expected to start. Like even Jaden Sancho and Ben Chilwell missing out in the 23 man squad. It's a long tournament. Does he bring them back in? Of course, there's going to be you know setbacks with injuries, etc. But it's 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 certainly one that he has to find a way to keep them all happy and keep them all fresh. Whether he changes, you know, makes changes for the Scotland game, who knows? Who do you think is actually keeping Grealish out of the team? Is it is it Mount? Is it is it Foden? Does he consider Grealish a forward or a midfielder? Or is it aware a weird way? Like, is it possibly Calvin Phillips is keeping him out of the team? I think it's probably more Raheem. Um, right. I don't know. Look, I know I know Jack could potentially play as an eight or as a ten. He seemed to be deployed. Know, more high up on the left. Um, that's where I kind of think you see the best of him because offensively he's probably not as acute as some of the other ones, you know, working back. But that's that's what you get with a player like Jack Grealish who wants to get forward, wants to make things happen. We've seen his assists um, and the chances he creates with Aston Villa. I think it's more, he's a very, very different type of player than Raheem. I think the, you know, the reason why Garrett went with him is you know, Raheem's. You know, so quick and he offers that, you know, running in behind all the time. And we know Harry Kane drops deep. But if Harry Kane is dropping deep to get on the ball to try and make something happen, we need players running in behind. And it has to be a yo-yo effect. And I think Grealish is a bit similar to Kane and they want to come and get on the ball and make it happen, you know, deep down, be the one that's putting the ball through. I just find there's probably an imbalance if Grealish and Kane kind of play together if he plays them off the left. Foden's another one, you know, who wants to come and get the ball 
he'll run in behind, yes, but not as much as Raheem. So you could make a case for playing in midfield, but you probably, you're not going to get the defensive duties out of Jack Grealish. That's inevitably why Aston Villa moved him forward. Um, obviously, he played in, as a 10 in, in the championship, but then when he got into the Premier League, they have to push him higher up and play him from the left. It'll be certainly interesting to see what Garrett does do, you know, because you expect Grealish to get some game time and, you know, be, be a key player for England. Why did Calvin Phillips look so good yesterday, David, and why has he looked so good playing for England? What, what is it about his uh, skill set that, that he brings so much to this England team? I think it's, I think it's, he's very composed on the ball. Nothing seems to phase him. He, he strikes me kind of as one of those players that could, if he played in a game in League Two today, he'd still look very good. He kind of, hey, I don't, hey, the best way to probably describe it is he could play at any level, look very good. And I think like he just slotted in there, like he's been, I don't know how many caps he has. I don't think he has too many, but it almost felt that he'd been around for, you know, many years just playing and he leads. He doesn't get as uh, forward as he did yesterday, but you just see he's great dynamic running in him, picking up that ball off Kyle Walker, driving at the heart of, of the Croatian defence. And then obviously the weight of pass is perfect for him, so he doesn't need to break his stride. Um, it's it's just his, he's just very level-headed. He's composed, obviously, look, and highlight the range of passing, as we all know that if you've watched any bit of Leeds this season or even the game yesterday, he's very comfortable on the ball. It's just his demeanour, the way he goes about, like even, you know, building that partnership with Declan Rice, you know, Declan was probably one that wouldn't have grabbed the headlines yesterday, but he had a very good performance and everything he did, he did well. Um, so there's a nice little balance with them. But then, you know, obviously he gave the nod to Calvin Phillips. You know, Jordan would have been fit and raring to go and wanting to play. Of course, he's not had the game time, but it's another big call from Garrett to, you know, put in someone who is of his experience as, you know, someone like Henderson. Yeah. Like, I mean, are, are you watching the tournament so far, David, as like with your midfielder cap on and thinking this has been a good tournament so far for the midfielders union like I mean I know you were watching the Netherlands and Italy as well like from Barella to, to Wijnaldum to, to Calvin Phillips like the, the midfielders you expected to play well have all kind of dropped the mic a little bit the first couple of days and said we are here and it's going to be our tournament <laughs> I wouldn't have used the analogy drop the mic like yeah but they have I think everyone knows that you need the defenders to be defending well you, your midfield that's where games are won and lost um, if you can win that upper battle, you know, that was the thing we all highlight. Phillips's performance, um, he got the better of, you know, Kovic, Brofovic, and Modric, you know, um, that was the big thing. And you touched on there, the Italian team were very good. They were impressive, albeit Turkey were awful. Um, the Dutch, you know, they have a wonderful midfield in Wijnaldum, who we've seen for many years playing the Premier League. De Jong, who I'm a, a massive fan of, um, the Rune and all that, they just... Just these players are finding ways to control games. Um, and look, I know the Netherlands obviously lost their way after the hour mark. They were comfortable um, and left Ukraine back into the game. But midfielders really are kind of shown what's what and why it's so important to have good midfielders who are you know good technical players and who can keep the ball, obviously dictate the tempo of games. You wanted to talk, Owen, about um, the Italians. It seems like, as you're saying, it seems like a long time ago, but they were pretty good. Yeah, like, I mean, just kind of mentioning there, David, like, it's, you kind of touch on how bad Turkey were on Friday night. I think everybody who had them as dark horses are uh, immediately looking for uh, perhaps a, a darker horse to, to get on board with over the next little while because they were just uh, atrocious. Um, sometimes with, with this Italian team, there is this disconnect, it feels, between some of their club form and, and their national form like Immobile may be the, the perfect example of that like the, this perfectly mm. sized fish in a perfectly sized pond when he plays for Lazio and then maybe a little bit of a fish out of water when he actually plays with Italy so is this the start of something new from him and, and his teammates and and how impressive was it from their perspective on Friday night? Of course look you know Mancini's come in and he's, he's steady the ship obviously they've had a four in the last two tournaments um, whatever They've kind of come in and they have this huge unbeaten win or unbeaten run, sorry, gone. I think that's nine clean sheets in a row. Um, like yeah, Mancini bringing back in Cellini and Benucci, you think they've, I think it's like 200 caps between the two of them. Like they're both stalwarts who've been around for many years. But that, uh, a lot of people have raised question marks about, you know, if they go deeper into the tournament, will they be able to survive against, you know, bigger nations or the better teams? I think they will be. Um, they're two wonderful players who've been around a long time. And, 
even see Cellini the other night, like bombing down from centre back into you know Turkey's half, trying to get crosses in, or trying to block block clearances, everything. I think there's just a nice balance with Italy. I think they'd lost their way, and I can I think Mancini's brought that connection back, as you said, to the fans because. I think the biggest thing for Italy is they've always really had like a number 10 that would, you know, stand out, whether it be Agio, El Piero, Totti or whatever. They don't seem to kind of have that maverick player. Up. And there seems to be just a good balance of all good guys who are desperate to do well for the Italian shirt. Um, and, you know, there is a good feel factor with them. You know, momentum in these tournaments is massive. Um, I think it was Antoine Griezmann said there recently, it's your seven games away. Um, like Italy be looking at one game down, we've got six to go to potentially winning the tournament. It was a good, comfortable performance. Obviously, they've got Verratti to come back into the team, who was a, is a massive player for them. So I'm expecting big things. Italy were, were, you know, the team I tipped as a dark horse with a mobile top goal scorer. So I'm happy he's <laughs> off the mark and, you know, Italy have won 3-0. Yeah, two, two quick things struck me from the weekend. One, Michel Platini, what a genius. The idea of having the tournament in a bunch of different house cities how jealous I feel now that the Ireland games, the games aren't going to be in Ireland and, you know, the Ireland games that we never qualified for. Like, it was a brilliant idea and actually in future when we could all go to these places and have little mini festivals all around Europe, I think it's now proven to be a good idea. Um, and then the second thing is the bloated tournament that everybody's given out about. Actually, you know what, it's kind of good because it means that all the good teams are going to have some warm-up games, they're going to get the opportunity to find their best sides and the quarter-finals, semi-finals and final should actually be all the best teams in Europe fully primed I don't know. I kind of feel like it's a it's a win win so far. No, it is. And do you know what? There's been a, a very good standard of football. Um, there's been there's not really been any game where you've kind of like you know fallen asleep watching or whatever. There's been a bit of excitement. Um, of course, you can highlight little parts and moments and games. In certain games, has been you know the weather has been a massive factor. You look at England, Croatia with the sun, and that that's going to be very difficult. But every game has been you know very good and I, I, I'm i with you Jared. that I do like the way that you know obviously there's games Wembley, Baku of course you know Holland playing Amsterdam Italy playing in Rome there's all that kind of feel good factor and of course um, I heard um, Owen saying earlier there at the start of the show like you know having that you know 20 to 25,000 fans in there there's, there's a nice kind of feel it's like even in, in the opening ceremony listening to Andrea Bocelli and then obviously you know in Italy it, it was a cut to the crowd and some fellas like, you know, looking elsewhere and then there's a screen for a penalty and he's not even looking, he screams and there, there is. And, you know, the tournament so far has been really good and you know, I'm really enjoying it. Like, I mean, as somebody who tipped Italy and the Mobile for top scorer, once you hear Bocelli on Friday night, you're like, this is oh. sorted, this is in the bag. Oh, that was, that was it. I was sitting there all emotional, listening to Andrea, I'm a big fan. Um, and of course, then when Italy do the business, Obviously, I know the, um, the Marlon goal at the start, but I was kind of like, come on, I'm Mobley. I'm after hanging my hat on you. Um, so he's got one and one, so I'll take that. I know Lukaku's got two, but I have faith. I have faith in the Italians. Justifiably so. Scotland are in action today. This is a team, there hasn't been too many teams so far you've seen and gone, OK, I can see them being one of those unexpected countries to make a surge. I think the Scots might be capable of doing something. I think they've just got enough peppered talent through the team and a real strong sense of unity and an underdog spirit, all the kind of stuff that you would expect a team to need to be able to make some noise. What do you think? Can they make some noise? I think they will make noise, yeah. Um, obviously, I know you've got the Czech Republic today, but it'd be very, very hard for them not to have one eye on England, you know, knowing that they're around the corner because a lot of these lads are playing in the, you know, the Premier League. I'll have teammates as they've come against many times, you know, I think they will. Um, I just like what Steve Clark's kind of built. There's a very good togetherness about the squad. It's almost, I get the impression, it's almost like a club feel about them. Um, all the lads seem to get on really well. There's no big egos or big characters. Like, of course, most people are well aware. I know Andy Robertson um, from my time playing with them. He would be the biggest biggest player in that, you know, in that group. And like, he's a very level-headed you know, there's no ego there. There's nothing fresh off winning the Champions League and Premier League. There's nothing, there's nothing with him, and it just seems to be, you know, good, a good feel factor about them. And um, they've got some, you know, very good players. Obviously, with McTominay, uh, McGinn, Kieran Tierney, Robertson. It's just something nice about them. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how they're going to get on today. Obviously, I would like to see them do well. Um, 
And obviously, you're hoping that they win kind of going down to Wembley on Friday for the, for the England game where there's kind of like fireworks in that. Yeah, plenty uh, for us to get our teeth stuck into. David, good to have you back. Time to, say, go time to say goodbye, though. You can get my Andrea. <laughs> which, hey, hey, what? I like it. Can you, <laughs> can you give us a blast? Well, Conte to party euro. Oh, yeah. I'm not singing it for you. Uh, Come on. Don't worry. No, 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 no. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> if, Italy, if Italy win the Euros and Mobley stop goal score, I'll sing the entire song to you in Italian. Hey, there you yeah, go. That's a promise. Yeah, you got to yeah. be aware. John Jaws made yeah, that promise I, to us a long time ago about singing You'll Never Walk Alone if Liverpool win the Champions League. And he had to come into studio and he, and he did it for us. So we've, we've got a track record here of uh, well, people well, making promises. I think, I think if I'm right and Italy do win the Euros and Mobley is top goal scorer, I'll fly out to Rome. <laughs> and I'll sing it. I'll sing it at the Coliseum. <laughs> Myself in a Mobley on top, oh, over yeah. my shoulder. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> on that note, David, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, Cheers guys. Thanks. Uh, future singer David Myler with us this morning here at uh, 16 minutes past eight. We've got a packed show still to come here on OTBAM. We're going to be talking hurling with Limerick Star, Road Hegarty a little bit later on. Football with Paddy Andrews later on this hour. And we're back after these with the latest on Christian Eriksen. OTB. AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Don't know what to get your golf mad dad for Father's Day? Well, you do now. A subscription to Golf Weekly, the best golf podcast on the planet. Packed full of interviews with top golfers. Shane Lowry, how are you keeping? I'm good, thanks. Watch parties with Golf Weekly guests. This is our first ever major watch-along party. And tips on how to improve your dad's game. For the perfect gift this Father's Day and just $3.99 a month, go to otbsports.com slash golfweekly. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie Why not check out the Boyle Sports betting app for a full range of markets on shots on target, assists, passes and more on every match of the Euros, all powered by Opta. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, CBG. Boyle Sports. This is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie. Invisible Threads, a Go Loud original. As we celebrate the sixth anniversary of marriage equality, Invisible Threads meets older members of the LGBTQ community who reflect on their journeys and tell their stories. From shame and isolation to conversion therapy, from living with fear to coming out as an older person. Join me, James O'Hagan, for this powerful eight-part series, winner of the first Go Loud Podship. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 18 minutes past eight, OTB AM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Time for us to uh, go and talk about Christian Eriksen. Johnny Wojciech Cockberg is a BT sports journalist based in Copenhagen. Johnny, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. How are you guys? Thank you for having me. So, what is the the general sense now of how this whole situation transpired? I, maybe before we get to that, what's the very latest on Christian Eriksen's health? That's the single most important thing here. Well, uh, not a lot of have has come out, but uh, we know he's he's uh, he's stable. He's in good condition. He's been talking with his. Uh, his team teammates this Sunday, they've been uh, chatting uh, via video link and he's uh, he seems to be uh, in, in fine conditions, uh, uh, but but we don't know a lot of details. Um, there's a press conference coming up a bit later today with the players for the first time breaking their silence. Um, so we hope to get a little more information about what they know about uh, Christian's health. Can you talk to us a little bit about the, the medical staff? Have they become heroes in Denmark? You know, we, we would tend to know a little bit about the medical team who, who backed the Republic of Ireland football team. What has that story been like and how has that been told in Denmark? Um, well, yesterday there was a press conference with uh, um, uh, the team, Danish manager Kasper Juhlmann, the football director uh, Peter Möller, and uh, the, the medical uh, doctor Morten Bolsen. Uh, and he he kind of became of a, a viral sensation in Denmark because um, he 
it was one of the, the leading uh, factors in, in, in saving uh, Christian Eriksen's life. Um, so he he became the the image of 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 of, um, of you can say of, of the success of a, tra of a traumatic moment in, in Danish football history and Danish history in, in general. So yeah, he's. Uh, He's been celebrated as a hero, um, and he was visibly shaken yesterday. And uh, I think it was an emotional moment for a lot of Danes um, seeing um, a medical professional who you might see as only a professional, but he he showed a lot of emotion. And uh, yeah, he he definitely is a is, is is looked upon as a hero at the moment. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about that emotional roller coaster that you guys, as a as a nation must have been on from the moment where Christian Eriksen kind of begins to trip and fall over and the ball hits him. Oh man, I, I get the goosebumps just uh, thinking about it. I was there uh, working uh, with the three other colleagues and um, um, the silence that that kind of overtook the stadium is, uh, is something I'll never forget and I think Denmark as a nation will never forget because um, I, I think everybody thought he, he was gone um, because we didn't get a lot of information. Um, um, and and that, that's even though, uh, thankfully, he's, he's, he's alive and well, uh, that trauma is, is still, still here, of course, and, and will take a lot of time to, to work through um, because, yeah, I think that the, the, the sense was that that one of the Danish players died on the pitch. That was that was the belief on the press stands. I thought as as well. I I ran out of the stadium when he was carried off off the pitch to see if we could get a glimpse of anything what was going on. And I saw uh, the ambulance leave the stadium. Thankfully, the the hospital where he was taken to is just two, three, four minutes away from 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 Park and in Copenhagen. You can you can see the the hospital from the stadium. But he was taken. Um, uh, the ambulance was was driving away very slowly and with no um, I don't know what you call it in English, but with no blinking lights on. So I, w I thought, why are they not in a in a rush to get him to the hospital? And I in that moment I thought it was a sign of of him not being alive anymore. So I went into the stadium again, convinced that that he was he was gone because we we haven't seen the images that that was. Uh, flooding social media with with, with him um, visibly being conscious, leaving the pitch, and we had no information at all. And and that trauma is is very much still here in in Denmark, and and I think in a lot of Danish people. And no doubt, and and the the footage emerged very quickly afterwards of the the uh, Danish fans and the Finnish fans chanting Christian and the answer, the response coming, Ericsson. Was that after news emerged that he had been stabilised, or was that in the in the kind of terrifying interim period where the fans in the stadium didn't actually know what was happening? I think there was a little bit of information slipping out that he might be okay. It wasn't official. So I think that it was a, uh, it was a heroic moment from, from, the, from the Finnish fans uh, mostly, but of course the Danish fans as well, because it was, it was a, a bit of togetherness in a, in a strange, difficult, traumatic uh, period of, of everyone's uh, life. So they, they came together and uh, of course the news started to flood that he was stabilized and he was alive. And uh, and that of course lifted the spirits in the stadium and, and, and the Finnish and Danish fans uh, kind of joined together. And it was, a, it was truly a beautiful moment that a lot of people have um, found uh, comfort in that moment because it showed what what football also can be about, about compassion and, and togetherness. Johnny, how difficult was this as a journalist for you and your colleagues to cover? Because there is a fine line sometimes between intrusiveness and covering a story. So how difficult was that for you, that particular challenge over the last couple of days? Uh, it's been one of the most difficult moments of my professional professional life and and also of my my general life because um, um, we're all uh, I'm actually getting a little emotional just talking about it because we're all people um, we all have um, loved ones and um, I think it's um, and and but also as a journalist you have a job to do you have a job to 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 give information to the public but. You also have to find a line about what information you give. You have to find a line if 
if, if where you, as you said, is uh, you're not intrusive in, in someone's personal personal life. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about um, which pictures to sh to show. Obviously, everyone has seen uh, the images of Simone Kerr, the captain, comforting um, Christian Eriksen's wife. Um, and in those moments where we didn't know uh, what was going on, we, we held those images back. And that's just, just an example of, of the difficulty of, of, of the situation. Um, and we still, uh, we're still in the, in the middle of it, but because what, what, um, what can we as journalists be allowed to do from, from here? How, how much time um, from the incident uh to a moment where we can maybe talk to some of his parents or friends or uh all these uh these thoughts are we st we're still having him and 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 it's a difficult uh difficult line to 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 follow it, it definitely is how did you feel when the game resumed i i was in shock um i think all of my colleagues were just um baffled because how could we how could we continue and uh, we're not the players uh, we're, we we don't we know Christian Eriksen as a football player but they know him as a as, as a friend as a as a family man and and and, and they they had to play on and uh, if it was difficult for us as journalists and as, as fans in the stands I, I couldn't imagine the situation the players were put in um and actually I, I felt um it just felt so wrong uh, and I'm still I, I'm um, if I if I put away my my, my journalistic uh, cap, I am as a person. I, I'm I'm still a bit angry that the players were put in that situation because um, the Danish uh, manager Kasper Ullmann said yesterday that uh, when he look look back on the decision, they they should never been on the pitch at all after that incident. Yeah, I think I think everybody can feel that now, and certainly and and probably at the time, a lot of people felt like the, there was no way that. The Danish team could do justice to themselves and to their country, and to therefore to the tournament in the aftermath of what had happened. And um, and look, it's a very difficult scenario for them. Uh, in terms of what happens now, will the team? Do you think the team will be able to get back into the tournament, or is it kind of irrelevant? Uh, maybe it can be a, a little bit of both. I think. Um I hope that they can use this. Um, they're going to play the Belgium game on Thursday. Uh, that's for sure. Um, that's what they've said. They're going to play it. Of course, there's a lot of work uh, mentally being prepared for a game that seems so ir irrelevant after what happened. But but uh, maybe it's a bit more relevant now that we know Christian Eriksen is alive and well. Uh, of course, we don't know his near future. But the most important thing is that he's alive and I think the players can use that as maybe a bit of a therapy uh, session and maybe we can use it as a therapy session as a nation to come together in Parken on Thursday 25,000 uh, people would be will be allowed in the stands and I think it could be um, a mom a turning point uh, a moment we can we can heal it as a nation, and I think the players um, I, I don't care I don't think a lot of uh, Danish Fans, Danish people in general care what 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 the Euros is going to be like uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a sports sports matter. Uh, I don't I don't think anyone cares if they lose to Belgium and and, and go out in the group stage. I just think uh, everyone cares that they um, come together and uh, and try to 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 move on in some kind of fashion where 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 they can heal. And I think that 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 moment uh, at the at Parken on Thursday is is the moment to to, to heal and uh, Roberto Martinez, the Belgium national uh, manager, told that to me yesterday when I was at the Belgium press conference that he hopes that it could be a moment of celebration of Christian Eriksen and yeah. I think that was a beautiful thing to say. Yeah, well, look, I mean, we we obviously saw Christian Eriksen's best hour of football ever for Denmark when he scored a hat trick against us in Dublin. <laughs> and yeah, sorry uh, we, about that. You well, know, look, we you know I think in retrospect we're all pretty glad that we we got to see him at his absolute peak because. It should be a celebration from this point forward for for Denmark of him and the fact that he survived. And I, I think of your medical staff as well. It's like under the pressure that they were under to remain calm and to continue on and to do their job. Like you know, that's what they've been trained for and blah blah blah. They're supposed to be able to do it, but actually, to 
to do the thing you're supposed to do at the moment of highest pressure is a fairly phenomenal thing. And I'm, I'm glad your man has become a viral sensation and a bit of a hero. Johnny, you were brilliant this morning. Thanks a million for, for being so open and honest with us. And, uh, and we wish you the very best of luck for the rest of the tournament. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Take care. Johnny Wojcik Cockberg there from uh, Copenhagen this morning. Uh, if you want to leave a comment, you can, of course, text us 0879-180-180. You can WhatsApp us there, old-fashioned text either way. Uh, or you can get us on the YouTube comments. LTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Paddy Andrews joins us next to talk Gaelic football here on OTBAM. Yesterday we brought you live updates from Monaghan's dramatic win against Galway in Clonus and Mayo's win against Clare in Ennis. We're going to bring you full reaction from our pundits at half past nine on OTBAM this morning. Here's Jermaine Blake on Monaghan doing just enough to stay up in Division 1. He's not afraid of taking them pressurised kicks. Yeah, but that that's the experience, I suppose, that Mana had, had and Galway didn't. Galway were very wasteful. When there were five points up, they had a few chances to kill the game off and they didn't do it. That just comes with experience. Conor McManus, he's very funny. He just hovers around. He wastes that opportunity. But what a raider he has. He rarely misses a, a shot. But on the other side, Jack McCarran did it as well for that to, to, to win it by a point. What a score that was. You know, on the 45 under pressure, he slotted it straight over the bar. So, you know, the forward line is moving well for Monaghan and in general they seem to develop the style of play over this league you know they're, they're not as reliant on Conor McManus as they were and they're still you know very competitive and winning games so you know they're in good stead going into the, the Fermanagh game in a few weeks time Yeah 8.31 this morning here on OTB AM and I'm delighted to say Paddy Andrews seven time All-Ireland winner with the Dubs it says here but Tommy's put in more importantly co-host of the football pod with Paddy and Andy Paddy how are you? Morning, Jay. How are you getting on? You all right? In the list of priorities, obviously, we've got to get this right for, for future billing. How are you getting on? Uh, oh, no, very good. Uh, very interesting weekend. I got, I got away for a couple of days with, with, with the missus, which was nice. Uh, I managed to squeeze in three or four of the games as well. So, you really uh, know how to romance a lady. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the road a long time, Jay. She knows the crack. She knows what she's into at this stage. Uh, well, listen, um, there's a few big things that I want to talk about. Uh, Owen hates when I hype up Kerry, but <laughs> Kerry are building a team that has the potential to beat Dublin. There's no point in you building a team that's going to be super defensive the way Tyrone tried to beat Dublin over the years. You've got to come at them with something completely different and you've got to come at them with a team who can score a lot of goals to keep you in the game because we know Dublin are going to chip over 18 to 22 points. And finally, it looks like Kerry are starting to build a side who are going to have the right pressure points, the right physicality, the right age profile, who, who can at least put it up to the dubs. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're spot on. And to, to be fair to Tyrone, despite what, what happened on Saturday night, I think Fergal Ogan and Brian Dewar have identified that as well, that if you're going to win the All-Ireland and take the next step, you cannot park the bus anymore. That style of play is redundant now in terms of it will get you to a certain point, but it's not going to be Dublin, it's not going to win the All-Ireland, it's not going to be Kerry. So, And that was such an interesting thing last year with Kerry that Peter King looked the decision and it's been well spoken about to, to play more of a defensive style against Cork in, in preparation to hopefully play Dublin later in the year. And it just did not suit Kerry. It doesn't suit the players they have. It obviously goes against their, their, their strong tradition as well. Kerry are the most dangerous when they play their forwards up front, when they play on the front foot. And they've been building over the last number of years. And Saturday night was was a classic example of that. They're about two, three years ahead of where Tyrone are trying to get to. Um, they've always had talented forwards, Kerry, whereas now, there's like exactly what you said, there's athleticism in their game. And, and, and we touched on it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Lots of different teams are trying to find two or three things when it comes to the National League. But Dublin and Kerry aren't overly concerned with winning the National League, particularly this year, and it's a, the nonsense of a shared title. Desi Farrell and Peter Keane were looking for, can we find two or three players that are going to push us on to the next level in the Championship? And I think Kerry have ticked a lot of those boxes. They've found the style of play that suits their players. They're back on the front foot and they're playing to their strengths. And that's the most impressive thing they've taken from the last five weeks in the National League, most certainly. And, and they're the standout team to, to challenge Dublin. They're so far ahead of the pack, Dublin and Kerry. And that was just so evident at the weekend as well. It does seem as well, Paddy, when you see these teams coming to try and contend with Dublin, they can have one or two great years and then they have maybe a couple of important retirements and they lose a bit of momentum. Mm. With this Kerry team, it feels, as you say there, the age profile is growing nicely at this point, that 
the 2019 uh, example is not irrelevant and they'll have grown from that. Last year is not irrelevant. They'll have grown from that. These are all layers that will be built upon if Kerry do eventually dethrone Dublin this year. A hundred percent. Like no team is going to come out of the pack in their first year and have all the answers. It, it, it takes time. It takes a bit of a journey. Like say, despite losing to Cork last year, Kerry would have learned a hell of a lot from that. They're not going to go back to that defensive style. It doesn't suit them. So that's, although it was a disaster at the time, they would have learned huge lessons from that. They were not that far away in 2019. Like that, the drawn final was so, so close. Another two minutes and Kerry could have won that game. And it's a totally different conversation. But like I said, what was Peter Keane looking for out of this National League campaign? Can they find a back that's going to be able to deal with a Conor Callahan or a Kieran Kilkenny or, or Dublin at their best? And, and you've seen Gavin White came forward there at the weekend, had an amazing game. Obviously, his goal will see the, at the highlights. But I thought Jason Foley was really good, really fast, tight, aggressive on, on Darren McCurry. They need a defender who can do that alongside Thomas Sullivan. They need legs around the middle of the pitch. David Moran... As good a player as he's been for Kerry, they needed someone who could work be in the engine room around him. And I think they found that in Dermot O'Connor. He's been a real standout performer of the National League. From, and, and two of the most important players, I think. Clifford is obviously going to take the, the plot. It's Sean O'Shea. But Paddy Clifford and Daryl Moynan have they've been a real edge to that Kerry forward line. They're making all the hard runs. They're allowing the marquee forwards to shine. And that's what Kerry needed. They couldn't be over-reliant on, on David Clifford just putting their hands together and praying that David Clifford's going to score 110 every single game. He'd probably get close to it, but Kerry needs two or three other forwards who can work the ball and, and occupy other defenders. And that's what those two guys have had really standout campaigns so far. And the balance seems to be right up front. And you could see it was like the perfect storm on, on Saturday night. All of those things click for Kerry, but that's that's the this journey they're on. And despite the four games they've played, the biggest moment and the most pleasing thing for Peter Keane under the whole National League campaign would be the third quarter against Dublin and Turles. That's what, what Kerry are going to learn most from out of the National League. They're not going to be worried about hammering Galway or, or the, the non-event against Roscommon or even the non-event that the Tyrone game turned into the weekend. The real learning point for Kerry was we got a run on Dublin in the third quarter in that game and got us back into the game. There were seven points down and all of a sudden Kerry outscored Dublin eight points to a goal and they landed on something there. They landed on a style of play, and that's what Peter Keane will take most out of the National League, I feel. Can we move on to the dubs? Because the, the game against um, Donegal, we've been dying to see Donegal against Dublin in a big yeah, game for no. years. We were waiting for this, and then ultimately it was a bit of a letdown because Dublin, oh, totally. Dublin just kept them at arm's length. And I don't know if there's a little bit of uh, Donegal trying to keep a bit of powder dry, and obviously Murphy's injured at the moment. You know, he was in his civilian clothes. Really dying to see what it would be like with him there, and I don't know. Can we do? Do we take anything from that game about where Donegal are at the moment, or about where Dublin are at the moment? No, uh, and I'm sure her answer no. And and that was the disappointing thing of the weekend. I mean, I if you could have handpicked two semi-finals, you, you've got Kerry against Tyrone, Dublin against Donegal, the, the, arguably the top four teams in the country playing against each other. But by the time the, the Dublin Donegal game threw in, Murphy wasn't playing. They weren't going to risk him with championship in two weeks' time. There was not going to be a league final after the result in Killarney and it just seemed to be a bit of a challenge match feel to it. Um, and we didn't get that test. You're right, Jared. Dublin Donegal has been a game that, that everyone's been waiting to see. We were waiting to play Donegal last year in the All-Ireland semi-final and they tripped up against against Cavan, obviously, in the final. So it's very hard to read into how that game panned out. I don't think it's a true reflection of Donegal. And then Dublin just did what Dublin will do. Control the game for, for the majority of it. And then in the blink of an eye, like the start of the second half, Dublin realised, OK, there's an opportunity here. Donegal are a bit flat and they reel off three points in the space of three minutes and all of a sudden there's seven points up in the blink of an eye and the game's gone from Donegal and it just petered out for the last 30 minutes. And that's what, what Dublin do. You wouldn't have learned anything from, on their side. It was more, can we see what Donegal and get a bit of insight and in how they're going to challenge Dublin? But we, we just didn't materialise at all. It was a bit of a disappointment that game. Uh, but I don't think it's a true reflection of where Donegal are at. I'd still have them as the, as the favourites for the Ulster Championship, despite that performance at the weekend. It did feel as if that was a very controlled performance from Dublin in some ways, and, and we're very used to seeing that. So is that, yeah. is that like them actually very... Are they purring along nicely, or are they just not being challenged? I, can't, I can never tell, because we've, we've actually seen them win championships where they've done that to everybody they've played the whole way through, and at the end, 
they get the big cup and everybody gets a medal. Like, uh, and that, you know, that's one of those... You're right, it's, it's a very similar pattern to what Dublin's done over the last four or five years. And that is, for me, I think that's what, what sets them apart. It's their controlling of the game, their game intelligence and their decision making. That is what sets Dublin apart, that a team can be kind of tickling along and it can be three or four points each. But Dublin have leaders in every single line of the pitch, whether it's Cluxton, Fitzsimons in the full back line, McCarthy and Fenton are on the middle, Khan and, and Scully in the half forward line, or Dean Rock or Kirk Kenny in the full forward line. Every one of those players knows exactly what's happening in the game at every moment of the game. So it might be 20 minutes in and the, the opposite the opposing team thinks we're doing all right here, but Dublin will sense that. They'll know. And when there's a the second there's a switch off from the opposing team, like how many times have we seen it over the last few years? In the space of two or three minutes, Dublin rattle off one four or one five or two two or four or five points for play. And in the blink of an eye, Dublin are gone. The game is over. They're six or seven points up. And then they just go back to what, what people might say, the kind of boring or monotonous style of play. But they've done the job. They're ruthless, so, so ruthless for those three or four minutes. Everyone on the pitch senses the opportunity that, OK, they've switched off. If Dublin win a kick out on an opposing kick out, they'll know, let's go for the juggler here. Or, or if Dublin turn over an opposing defender coming out, they'll know the defence isn't set, go for goal. Everyone, and, and you can see with Paddy Small's goal at the weekend, Donegal, it's 6-0, six 7-6, all, six. they think they're in the game. Dublin turned them over, there's an opportunity, and it's straight in, goal. And, and all of a sudden, the game's over. And, and that's what they're so good at. It's that intelligence. They'll sense the opportunity, and when they do, they are absolutely ruthless. And that's what sets Dublin apart more so than, yes, they've got really talented players, they're really fit, they're really strong. It's their experience and their game intelligence. They just do not make the wrong decision. It's so, so rare you see Dublin giving away anything easy. And that's the big thing, I think, that sets them apart from, from the Mayos or Tyrone to Dunning going to this world. Yeah, it sometimes feels in a game like this that the four-point margin of victory is like a predetermined outcome and everything else in the <laughs> is just, uh, I guess, window dressing. Like One of the things, like you said, there, it felt last week as if this might be the top four teams in the country mm. going toe-to-toe over the course of the weekend. Mayo, though, you could throw into that top four mix. We just don't yeah. know. And, and in some ways, they've been, they've been insulated, Paddy, from any real criticism because they've been in Division 2. So, so what's your read, if you, as best you can read it, on, on where Mayo are at? I think Mayo will win the Connacht Championship. Um, and, and that's, despite being in Division 2, and that's the interesting thing. We've had kind of five weeks of football here. And you're kind of thinking, what have you really learned? Well, if you sat down and start the National League, it would say Dublin would win the Leinster Championship, Kerry would win Munster, Mayo would win Connacht, and Donegal would win Ulster. And it'd be Donegal against Kerry and Dublin Mayo would be all around semi voice. Nothing's changed from what I've seen. Even with, with Mayo in Division 2, like Galway have <laughs> Galway haven't kicked on, and obviously the, the relegation yesterday, Ross Common was classic Ross Common. They're relegated to Division 2 again for probably the fifth time in 10 years. Mayo are still the top team in Connacht. And you could get a glimpse of that yesterday as well. The first half, like Clare, the fairy tale would be Clare getting up to Division 1, but, but, but the, the gap was shown there that, that Mayo were Division 1 team. They had a bit of a blip last year. They got relegated, but they still made the all the final. And for 30 minutes yesterday, Mayo show what they're all about. They're still the top team in Connacht. I'd be amazed if they didn't win the Connacht Championship. And, and the important thing for Mayo yesterday was some of their more experienced players seem to be back to their best. Aidan O'Shea is so important for them. Lee Keegan was back from cornerback sprinting up the pitch. Classic Lee Keegan. Ushin Mullen seems to be a real fine for them as well. And, and it's back to Mayo playing their best. Style. Everyone attacking from the back. It's so athletic, so hard to play against. And for me, despite the fact they're in Division 2, and, and you're right, it, it's not an accurate gauge. They're, they're playing teams that you'd expect them to be, but... When you compare it to what you've seen from Ross Common and Galway in Division 1, I'd be amazed if Mayo didn't win the Connacht Championship. Who's the second best team in Leinster, Paddy? <laughs> I would have said Mead, but that was a. It couldn't have went much worse for them yesterday. And you've been kind of waiting for Jack O'Connor to, to come in and, and get, a, get a rise out of Kildare. Andy mackin has been there for, for four or five years with Mead. They've been building. They were in Division 1 last year, and okay, they didn't win any of the games, and you can kind of say, well, that's a bad year, but, but all the games were close. They would have learned a lot from that, and I fully expected them to come back up to Division 1, and they started off the league campaign, and you would have thought that as well, but the way it's finished for them, 
I know that the, the Mayo game was a bit, uh, both teams had qualified, so you couldn't read too much into it. But that was a big game for me yesterday. They lose the game. They lose Brian Menton. They lose Donald Keoghan to injuries. There's no time to be injured this season with the way the championship's coming around. Conor McGill gets sent off. He's going to be suspended for, for the first game. They lose the rail as well, <laughs> which, which, which is just, it was one of those really tight games. And Kildare will take huge. To win a game like that, Kildare will get a huge boost out of that. They, they're into Division 1, but they've won a real battle. And it was just a bad day for me to all round. And, and the bottom line, they're not in Division 1. And if you're going to be competing to try and progress, you need to be in the top division. And it's such a setback for me to to not make it back up, but also to lose those players. It's It probably puts Kildare, yeah, I, I'd have them as the second best team now. And Jack O'Connor is kind of building momentum going into the championship now. I think me, they're one of the teams who got completely destroyed by there not being a backdoor last year and not being an opportunity for yeah. them to get back into what would have been Super 8s if the Super 8s did existed. Or, you know, just that extra month of football and that extra month of training, we would have seen them benefit from that this year and the straight knockout did them no favours last year. And likewise, you know, Kildare had no chance to lick their wounds and become uh, a team who understood what Jack O'Connor was trying to do. So uh, you're right, the, like, a lot of pressure on Jack O'Connor to kind of finally deliver and, and maybe mm. we can get into that a bit more. They've had some injuries as well. Um, that I think uh, Highland went off, uh, Feely went off, and without those two players, yeah. you know, ultimately it's going to be another cakewalk for the dubs through Leinster as well. That was my last question about this. Like, um, the other teams, most of the other teams have some fairly big games which will keep them very battle hardened by the time the All Ireland semi finals roll around. Is that in any way a concern this year, given the condensed nature of things, that a lot of teams will have a lot of confidence and momentum, big mo? Uh, by the time the semi-finals happen, whereas the Dubs will just not really have had that opportunity to test themselves against good quality opposition. I don't think that will matter to Dublin. I think that's, for being honest, I think that's been the case for the last seven or eight years um, with the Leinster Championship. Dublin prepare for every game, whether it's Wicklow in the first round of the Championship, whether it's Kerry in the other in semi-final or final. They'll be ready to go when they need to be ready to go. Um, I, I don't think it, it, it's much of a, a concern, and I know that's been leveled at them in the past, but, but the, the level Dublin are at and the experience they have of doing this, even with Desi coming in as a new coach and things like that, the show has just been kept on the road. So so Dublin, look, like I say, it looks likely. You could say Dublin will play Mayo in a semi-final and Donegal will play Kerry. Dublin will be ready to play Mayo if that's the case i don't see that ever being an issue, issue for them really it's just they're, they're so experienced they're so intelligent they're so smart at this stage they've that many miles on the clock that they'll be ready to go when they need to be ready to go whether they've had what perceived cakewalks in leinster or, 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 or tougher games i don't think it would be too much of a difference to them all right paddy great stuff thanks a million for joining us cheers no worries guys thanks bye bye paddy andrews you get more of the good stuff from paddy and andy on the football pod with paddy and andy and tommy rooney which drops every Wednesday afternoon. It's been sensational stuff so far. If you've got any interest in Gaelic football, if you've got any interest in proper analysis of sport, then the uh, the minds of the two lads as uh, corner forwards who had to work for everything that they got. Uh, so we've got a footballer of the year and a seven-time All-Ireland winner giving us proper insight into how the dubs prepare for the first time and how Mayo prepared for the dubs in the greatest rivalry of the last decade in Irish sport, then you should uh, get onto that. You can subscribe to the individual stream the uh, football pod with Paddy and Andy, you'll get that uh, on the OTB Sports app or wherever you get your podcasts. And an L rating on iTunes would definitely help that as well. And then, of course, you can also get it by just subscribing to the OTB GAA stream. So that is all available free, gratis, and for nothing. So it costs you no money to listen to that good stuff. A reminder, OTB AM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, Star with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Oh, how confident are you allowing yourself? How excited are you, are you allowing yourself to feel? about how great this Kerry team is and then might be beyond that. I, I think you just have to kind of suspend any sort of caution at this point because that's what the team have done. They've been, they've kind of like looked at the, the data points in their team, they've looked at the strengths and weaknesses in their team and they were like, they're a bit like the Netherlands last night but just with a better chance of winning the main silverware. They said, screw it, let's just take the handbrake off and let's just see what happens. And some crazy things have happened. A lot of goals scored over the course of the league campaign. That mad third quarter against Dublin, I mean, the journey so far has been pretty fun this season. Let's just put it like that. And I mean, don't, like there, there is, it just gets very boring very quickly if you start talking about whether or not a team will win in All Ireland because there is still very much one team I think who is very much the favourite. And it's like Dublin have every team on a piece of string of varying lengths. Now, in fairness, the, yeah. the string piece of string with Kerry is 
maybe a couple of inches yeah. at, the, at this moment. Uh, I don't know if you remember how ridiculous it was that we talked ourselves into the fact that Meath might give the Dubs a game on the basis of the goals they scored and how they were building a team specifically designed to score goals. The Dubs give you chances. All the, all the, all that material, I'm going to roll it out again for uh, Dublin Kerry this year. <laughs> but this really time, fills me with confidence. This time I actually have, you know, we have a, a really strong, nasty streak in that Kerry team. Uh, they're athletic. They've got everything that you need. They, they're like, come on, you must be, you must be very excited about this. Yeah, like without question. And good. Uh, and it, like I think you make a good point there as well about how road tested they, they will be as well. I think Claire and and I hopefully hopefully just being honest here. Hopefully Cork actually are in Kerry's path because to exercise that ghost last year would be important. But I think Cork and Mayo both have a chaotic energy about them that Kerry are also bringing to the table at the moment. And I think from a purely spectacle point of view, I think it'll be a really good game. And Kerry and Mayo may be unlikely to meet in the championship this year because Dublin are probably going to take Mayo out. But I think that will be another brilliant clash, hopefully at some point in the next couple of years, at championship level. All right. It's uh, 10 to 9 this morning here on OTBM. This Monday morning, Monday the 14th of June. It is proper championship weather outside. And uh, we're delighted to be talking uh, about the championship when it comes to the GA. The hashtag hurling to the core ambassador Garod Hegarty joins us this morning to uh, talk about the launch of the second series of Borgosh Energy's Gaga Box, which features the most passionate hurling fans across the country filmed in their front rooms as they experience the agony and ecstasy of following their county's fortunes from home. You can watch Gaga Box and Borgosh Energy's hashtag hurling to the core YouTube channel throughout the Senior Hurling Championship. Garod Hegarty, good morning to you. How are you doing? How's it going, Lance? Yeah, good. Uh, it is championship hurling weather. Does it feel like... Um, you should be playing championship games at this stage of the year? Yeah, it does, definitely. Um, it's kind of nice to be back training in, in summertime and looking forward to championship now in a couple of weeks uh, after last year's, although it was, a, it was obviously a, a great championship for us last year, but um, I definitely prefer hurling at this time of year. I think it, I think the majority of people will definitely tell you that. Uh, it's much nicer to be playing in, in, short, in training in shorts and t-shirts rather than going out with several layers of gear on. So, uh, yeah, it's great to look forward to now in a couple weeks' time. It was obviously a completely different experience winning the second All-Ireland from winning the first one. Do you feel any kind of sense of disappointment or loss that you didn't get to do the traditional going around the schools and meeting the kids? Or because you'd done that the first time, did it matter a little bit less that that was taken away from you? Um, I suppose we kind of knew that we weren't going to be able to do that. We kind of knew there was going to be no fans at the, at the All-Ireland Final and we knew that there wasn't going to be massive crowds waiting for us when we came home, etc. Um, so it's not that we were kind of disappointed doing it and I suppose in 2018 we did all that as well and it is kind of taxing as well uh, in the couple of weeks in the couple of weeks after the All-Ireland, although obviously it's absolutely unbelievable and that's what you try to set out to do at the, at the start of the year. It can be taxing after it, trying to get around to every school and make sure everyone's happy and everyone wants a photo with the cups, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it was quieter. It was definitely a quieter few weeks after the All Ireland, but it was it was it was definitely uh, an enjoyable couple of weeks, obviously as well. There probably comes a stage as well where you get good at winning. I assume, Grod. Like I, I assume, the second time around, even if there was no pandemic, might have been a bit easier, regardless. Yeah, definitely. I suppose we would have learned a lot, and we would have learned a lot after twenty eighteen. Um, in the celebrations, uh, in the celebrations after the final in 20, and obviously <clears throat> people were just so overwhelmed with everything, and I suppose we kind of got, got caught up in it as well in the few weeks and, and months afterwards. Um, and I'm sure in in 2020 it would have been different if there was if there was fans there, but um, I suppose that's just the way that's just the way it was last year. And look, all in all, you prefer you prefer fans to be at the games. Like you prefer if it was to happen again, you prefer the 2018 scenes rather than the 2020 scenes, you know. So. Um, with fans getting back to games in the last, in the last, obviously there was fans at games yesterday, and, and hopefully there will be more fans at games over the next few weeks, and it'll be increasing over the summer. So all players want fans to be at games, you know. So that's 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 why we play the game. You know, you want to see the emotion come in from the stands and the color and 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 the and the, and the noise. You know, you miss the noise. That's one thing that I definitely missed uh, last year. You miss the noise and the and the buzz when you get to the ground and things like that. So looking forward to it. It has been noticeable the impact that five hundred fans can make. Like it, it, it's it's kind of transformative. Yeah, it is. Of course, it is. Uh, it's kind of the games. The game is actually extremely different. I found last year the way the game is played and the way the game is is refereed. Um, you can kind of get away with a bit more when there's fans in the ground because there's so much more noise and uh, so on and so forth. So there's definitely way more emotion uh, on game day when there's obviously a full stadium compared to when it's just. 15 and 15 and your, and your management team and backroom staff and the couple of lads, there's a couple of subs 
Um, so it's completely, it's nearly a different sport when there's fans in the, in the ground, but obviously the, the game you grew up loving is the game where there's, where, where there's fans at the, at, at the stadium. So as I said, hopefully, um, hopefully there'll be, hopefully there'll be some nice attendances like games throughout the summer. We, we've obviously talked about the aftermath of, of winning and, and the impact that has on the um, just the, your ability to get headspace, I suspect, after winning your first All-Ireland and, and the difference between that and, and your second. In terms of playing like, and the evolution of the game, obviously you now have the experience of being the team that everybody wants to knock off, which, ha as we've seen over the last decade, has been very, very difficult for teams to go back to back. When you're thinking now about what you need to do to make sure that you're actually a better team than last year and therefore a better team than the team who who didn't go back to back in, in 2019. What are, you, what are those conversations about in terms of driving standards and tactical innovations and preparation and rest and recovery and all that kind of stuff? How, how do you become a better team even than the team that just won the All-Ireland last year? Um, I suppose it's a good question, uh, but it's, it's kind of the board, it's, it's the board answer unfortunately for, I know it's probably not what you want to hear, but you can't really look too far down the line. Like you can't be looking months down the line at an All-Ireland final in August or All-Ireland semi-finals, whatever it is. Like you just have to focus on, um, you have to focus on week on week and that's what we do. You know, we focus on, if we normally have a gym session at the start of the week and then you have a couple of training sessions on the field and then you have the weekend, whether that's a match or another training session. And you just have to kind of bring your A game to, bring your A game to the to week on week and make sure when you're going to train and that you're well prepared, you'll be just as well prepared going to train as you would be for a match. And that's kind of the way in the county players are nowadays that you're preparing so well for training as well as it's not just preparing well for matches and making sure you get the most out of yourself for training every night and as I said I know it's kind of the boring answer but that's all you can do you know you have to focus on the present and focus on getting the most out of yourself every week and then you I suppose you just have to hope that that's enough when you do get to the when you do get the championship time and especially the later rounds that you just keep doing what you're doing you don't have to do anything more than um, just giving your all at training every week and hopefully that's the, that's enough you know. Is hurling a more physical game now, growth than it was, say, in 2018? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. Um, like, obviously, strength and conditioning has been a massive... It has become a massive part of the game. But I, I, I believe that if you look at the, at the Brakey Kenny team in the, in the 2000s um, and all the All-Irelands, they, like, they, were, they were just as well strength and conditioned as, as any team is nowadays. So I don't believe uh, hurling has become more physical than it was... Um, maybe 10 years ago, you know, that's just, I know the game is always, it's always, um, it's always, a, it's always evolving. It's always, it's always, I suppose, trying to become, trying to become better. But I don't, I don't really see the game that has become too much more physical than it was. If you go back and watch any game in the, in the late 2000s, some of those could kind of the very all Ireland finals. Um, I wouldn't see too much of a difference between those games and, and some of the games nowadays. So, um, no, I don't, I don't, I don't believe so. No. Do you think teams are bringing in the physical challenge to you guys more, since you've become All Ireland champions, that, that that target on your back is something that they're trying to meet, both from a hurling skill set point of view, but also trying to test themselves physically and test your metal. Because there's been a bit of narkiness in, in certainly in the early rounds of the league this year, that it felt to me as if teams were desperately trying to prove to you guys that they were your match physically. Possibly. I don't know. I'm not in anyone else's, I'm not in anyone else's camp, so I don't really know what they're talking about coming into a game against us. But I know. For example, last year we were going down to play Tipperary um, in the championship down in Parky Creeve, <clears throat> and they were all Ireland champions. And you do, you do know that you have to go and try and you have to go and try and beat the, the reigning All Ireland champions, and that is a massive task. Obviously, they were the All Ireland champions at the time, and you know that if you can get over the All Ireland champions, then you do have a great shot of of of, of going towards the later the later rounds of the championship. So. Yeah, I suppose possibly that that may be something that other teams are talking about in terms of trying to trying to I don't know maybe have a target on your back or whatsoever. But um, as I said, we don't we don't focus on we don't focus on what other teams are trying to do. We just focus on ourselves. And I know maybe that's not what you want to hear. No, but, it's interesting because yeah. I, I think all the great teams had that. Like, and I know it, it always ends up sounding like a cliche. But if you go back to the point we were making earlier on about the dubs, no one's going to beat Dublin by trying to be Dublin or a copy of Dublin. Kerry are going to beat Dublin by being the best version of Kerry that they can be. And so ultimately that is them while understanding what the challenge is that the dubs are going to put down for them, being themselves and the best expression of themselves. And I think that's the success that Limerick have had is that they've decided this is the style that we're going to play. They've brought great physicality to that, but incredible levels of skill and stick work. And the point you made about Tipperary there is really interesting because it feels like that mindset has to flip a little bit from being the hunter to the hunted. How do you deal with that from a psychological perspective where you are now the hunted? 
Well, I suppose it's it's a great um, it's a great compliment to be the hunters. You know, that's that's what you want to be. You want to be the you want to be the team that that other teams see that you that you need to beat. To, to that if you are to go late, late in the All Ireland Champions, that if you can beat this team, then you have a great chance of going towards the later rounds. And I suppose we we do take that as as a great compliment being the being the current All Ireland Champions. But as I said, in any year, no matter who the All Ireland Champions are, if you're coming up against them, and you know if you can beat them, then and uh, you do have a great chance of going towards the later rounds. But as I said, look, we genuinely don't focus too much on the opposition, no matter who we're playing. It doesn't matter who we're playing. Um, we always just focus on ourselves, as I said, making sure that we're we're well prepared and that and training as hard as we can. And that's that's all we do, genuinely. We just focus on ourselves, making sure that when we go to training, that um, whatever whatever session Paul Canark has laid out for us, so whether it be in the gym with Mikey Kiley, whatever it is, um, that we're just focusing on ourselves and trying to be the best we can. And, as I said, hopefully that's enough then when you do get to the championship games. So do you feel that this current Limerick form is the best it can be, Gerard, or, or where do you feel you're at in terms of your your hopes for your championship level? I think I think um I think we're getting better. Um like I'm I'm twenty seven now in August and I'm nearly one of the nearly one of the older um panel members on the team and <clears throat> I suppose we do have a, we do have a couple of new lads on the panel as well also and um, yeah I, I believe that we're, we're we're not trying to we're not trying to stay where we were last year we're trying to improve on where we were um, in 2020 and um, I believe I believe we are we are getting better all the time and hopefully we can show that you know and as I said if we just keep focusing on ourselves trying to get better in training every week um, well then hopefully we can show that we are improving you know because we do have a nice we we still are in a nice. Um, there's still a nice age of, of, of players on the panel, as I said. Um, we're still all in kind of our, a lot of us are still in our mid twenties, and a lot of lads are even younger than that. Um, so we do have a nice blend of youth and experience, and I do believe that we are still, we are we are definitely trying to get better anyway. That's the most important thing. And as I said, hopefully then you can show it. Why is Paul Connard such a good coach? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, look, he's great experience. Look at his CV. He was with Clare in, in the early. In, in, uh, Obviously, the one the All Ireland in 2013, he was with him for a couple of years, and I suppose you probably have to ask him that question. But I'd imagine that he he spends a lot of time preparing sessions. He spends a lot of time, um, I'm sure, looking into how other teams train, whether that be in hurling or in other sports around the world and other professional setups. Um, I suppose he's just mid, mid, well, from what I can see, he's meticulous in his planning in terms of coming to train and. and you mentioned it a while ago in terms of that we have a, a set way to play and as I said that's what we do when we go to train and we work on that all the time um in terms of in terms of tactics and in terms of how we play and we just keep working on that over and over and over again and we're lucky to have him we're lucky to have him I've said it several times before he's he is a great coach and that's 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 pretty obvious um so yeah I suppose you probably have to ask him that question yourself in terms of how he is to a coach but we're just lucky to have him, and, and um, it's great. It's it's great that he is involved with us, you know. And is it mostly? Uh, is there individual stuff that you would be working on with the coaches, or is it mostly in teams and smaller groups so that you know you understand the patterns of play? And I, I suppose we're, we're very interested in this because um, Paddy Andrews talked a little bit recently about how the dubs they focus on catching and kicking and the basic skills, and everybody's kind of going, ah, no, you must be doing more than that. And obviously they're doing loads of video work and there's kind of classroom work and style of play and there's defence coaches and forwards coaches. And so, it, you know, we understand that it, it's very detailed, but from, from your perspective, do you tend to work more in groups or on individual stuff in, in training sessions as well? No, it's absolutely, the vast majority of stuff is, is working, as a, working as a team. Um, in terms of the drills that he might set out, um, each night of training but like in fairness to Paul Paul is top class but he's a great team with him as well he's a great he's, he's plenty of help and he's a great he, we have a great statsman as well in uh, in Shawnee O'Donnell and like in terms of if you if you kind of want individual um, I suppose feedback you can go to him and you can look at some of your clips and stuff like that and Paul, Paul would also give you some feedback with Shawnee but um, no the vast majority of stuff we do is is working as is, is working together working as a group because realistically when you go and play a game it's not individual, you know, you're going out with 14 other lads um, working together, trying to beat the opposition. So um, that's the majority of our training. It is, it is working as a team, working as a group, working on different things, you know, so. I have one last question. Just the, the quality of the, the contest and the game is something that has been up for debate in the league. And just 
putting that conversation that was going on there with your point at the start about how it's a different game with, with supporters there, it feels to me like the championship is going to be a very different championship to the hurling that we've seen in the league in terms of you know, the massive scores, all the frees that have been given. What's your take on, on the rude health or otherwise of, of how the game is at the moment? I've been saying it for years. I think Hurling has never been in a better position um, than, it, than it ever was. As I said, I, I, I think Hurling is, is improving year on year, um, especially since, and I know what hasn't happened the last couple of years, but with the introduction of the Round Robins here in the All-Ireland, like what the supporters want more games, what the players want more games, you know, how do people get better? They get better by playing, or get better by playing more games, getting more experience, playing championship games. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the game is in a great spot. I think um, there's been a lot of spotlight on, on there's been a lot of freeze, I suppose, in a lot of games in the league. But I think it, I don't think it's been as bad in the later rounds of the league. I think the referees are starting to do a great job uh, in a difficult position because there was a lot of spotlight on them in the, in the early rounds of the league and. Um, I think a lot of common sense has been applied in the last in the later rounds of the league in terms of in terms of free counts. If you look at it, just um, it's an assumption, but I would imagine that the free count has it has has reduced from the start of the league to the end of the league. Um, so I think referees have been doing a great job in terms of just applying a bit more common sense um, in the in the games later on in the league. And look, I, I genuinely believe that Hurling is in a great and is in a great position. Look at the competition. Um, that's going that's that'll be in the championship this year. You know this. There could be seven or eight or nine teams that could win the All-Ireland um, this year, you know, and I suppose in football, is the football as, as competitive as, as the Hurling Championship, even though there's way more teams in the football, like it is, the Hurling Championship, in my opinion, is much more competitive than the, than the football championship, you know, so in my in my, in, in my opinion, genuinely, I believe Hurling is in a great position, and um, as I said, with a small bit more common sense, I don't believe that there's too much needed to change the, change the game of Hurling in terms of rules or officiating and anything like that, and I do believe that common sense has been Applied a small bit more in the later rounds of the league, and I and I do believe that the uh, championship this year is 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 looking very very interesting. Yeah, I think you're dead right. Listen, Geroud, great to have you on as ever, and we wish you the very best of luck with the championship. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Geroud Hegarty there giving us some thoughts ahead of the start of the championship, and it is to launch the hashtag hurling to the core. Uh, which is Borgosh Energy's Gaga Box. You can watch it on Borgosh Energy's hashtag Hurling to the Core YouTube channel throughout the Senior Hurling Championship. Uh, here's what we've got for you on OTB Sports Radio between now and 7 o'clock this evening. Uh, at 1 o'clock, sorry, at 11 o'clock, the Euro Show is live uh, with Shane. It is OTB Gold from 1 o'clock, Colm Gooch Cooper. At 3 o'clock, it's State of the Union. Uh, at 4 o'clock, it is the Classic. Uh, it's our documentary series with Ken Doherty. And OTB Gold is Michael Rasmussen on doping in cycling at 6. And then... Tonight from uh, 7, of course, Joe and the lads back with you, looking back on the course of the weekend. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Plenty more still to come on OTBAM this morning. Going to bring you more GA reaction from Austin O'Malley and Jeremy Blake before 10 o'clock. We're talking tennis with Colin Bowie and we're back after these with Alan Quillen. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. You know, it's like getting married, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> Careful now. <laughs> Unusually, exceptionally brilliant. You know, for a lot of people, and Beppe has that quality. You've got a grip there, lads. Irish soccer's a joke. On and off the pitch will always be so, says one of our textures. She's just caught off the show, John. For the best Euro 2020 coverage, subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Why not check out the Boyle Sports Betting app for the latest betting and stats on every player and team with the Boyle Sports Euro Stat Center. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, Stevie G. Boyle Sports, this is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly, gamblingcare.ie. First up, a Go Loud original from News Talk. Get all the news you need to start your day with First Up, the podcast that brings you stories, analysis and interviews with the top newsmakers. First Up, available each weekday morning from 7am on Go Loud. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Nine minutes past nine this morning here on OTB AM. We're here with you all the way through until 10. Um, we've got uh, good stuff to come. We're going to be looking back with Colin Buig on the French Open. We still have uh, the around the ground stuff, post-match reaction and 
essentially it's all championship analysis now from this point forward when it comes to Gaelic football in particular. A reminder, of course, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Alan Quillen, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. How are you? Uh, the news came through that Ronan Keller is part of the training squad for the Lions. That must be great and also kind of frustrating because it means that you are like cigarette paper width away from making the squad. Yeah, it's good. It's good news for him. I think it shows he's next in line. Um, I think his form towards the end of the season has been outstanding. Um, his ball work, his his ability around the field is is sensational. Um, the only, I suppose, fear for Warren Gatlin was the line out throwing, and and that's probably why he didn't make it. Um, he's unfortunate, but th this week will do him the world of good. And I've said this before, you know, there's on average five six players who originally selected on Lions tours miss out and uh, through injury. And um, so there's every chance that he can end up going on a tour as a, a number of other Irish guys as well. But um, it'll be a great experience for him this week. And I think he deserves it. He'll learn a lot there. Um, and it'll do his confidence the world of good. Has that line-out throwing improved as the season's gone on, Alan? And, and how does he kick on again next season? Yeah, it has. It has improved. I think um, it's probably one of the reasons why... Um, he didn't start in the Six Nations games early on. Um, I think it's just, it's probably just a little bit of timing um, and confidence. I think for a hooker throwing a ball into a lineout, I know from myself being involved in lineouts all my life, it's uh, very fine margins. The lift has to be right, the timing. Um, I think Paul O'Connell would have made a difference going into the squad, going, um, you know, before the Six Nations, working with him. Um, and that development is is kind of ongoing. Um, so it's something that it's not that he's a bad line out thrower. I think it's just learning the timing, the flight of the ball. Um, some guys have technique where you know there. You look at I think back to Jerry Flannery, who in you know he his every throw he had was was a was a punch throw, a bullet throw at the start, and he gradually learned to to be able to put the ball and. Uh, you know, float it through the air a little bit. And so it's adding to it all the time. You know, someone like Frankie Sheehan was able to do both. Um, and, and, you know, every hooker has their moments and their, their periods in their career. And they're usually at the start when you don't have a lot of experience, when you're nervous. And, you know, the way line out defences have gone in the modern game, it's, it's, it's a lottery sometimes. And rightly, wrongly, I think the hooker gets most of the blame. But, it's all down to timing and stuff like that. So I think he's no issue with his throwing. I think it's just getting more confident and being able to put it between the certain the pods that are going up in the air, and, and that will come with 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 more experience. And something like this week will will benefit Ireland usually. It'll benefit Leinster usually as well. Uh, it's a real shame that the proper tour of the islands isn't going ahead from an Ireland perspective because the squad being named today. It's for a couple of, of matches, which will be very important for the players who are involved and the ones who are getting called up for the first time and getting their first caps. But it would have been a real opportunity for us to kind of see what that next tier of players are doing who are just below the lines and to see what the coach's thinking was and the evolution of the game plan. I'm sure they're annoyed as well. But notwithstanding, it is what it is. What do you expect and what do you want to be seen, seeing in the Ireland squad that is named today for the two friendlies? It's hard to get excited about these two games, isn't it? Um, usually... And when Lions tours are going on, Ireland are, are away on tour, and there's a kind of a jovial, exciting eff effect that 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 has, um, particularly for younger players. Um, bonding trip. Um, sometimes the games aren't that challenging. You know, you go to the USA, and um, we were in Japan in 2005 when the Lions tour was on. We had two tests there. They weren't. Uh, the most difficult games. Um, we were always going to win both, and we won them convincingly. Um, you know, so I think it's uh, the benefits going on tour are, are are important because you know it is about bonding and getting to know each other and and having that period of two or three weeks where the coaches can can you know see players up close and personal. It's a little bit different when you these two two home games. Um, they will go into. Uh, camps and stuff like that, but it's not the same. Um, so it's hard to get excited about them, but it's great that they have two games, and I think it's an opportunity for 
for I think the biggest opportunity is is for the younger players, a couple of them to get capped and, and feel that they're important and we talk about Ronan Keller's confidence. You know, you get in amongst the group um and train with them and, and, and win your first cap, it's all part of your progression. And I think that'll be important for a number of players this summer. We won't read too much into the results or even the performances, but I think Andy Farrell, of course, will want to win the two games and and see some 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 of those younger players put their hand up and and see if we can develop more talent and and more young and find one or two maybe three players who who come November I will be pushing for 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 um, the autumn tests. Yeah, in some ways it's about removing a bit of the mystery around your first cap and all the initiation yeah. and all that kind of stuff where it's like actually that bit's parked in a low pressure environment. So come November when we're playing one of the first tier nations or come the next six nations, you're kind of ready to go. Yeah, and you look at someone like Craig Casey, who's captain of Six Nations, Ryan Baird, um, you know, they feel part of, you know, they've played in the Six Nations. They they feel now that, you know, they'll be they'll be kind of bouncing around. They'll want to stand out. And I think there's there's um there's motivation for all the players, obviously to impress the coaches and like I say, on the outside, it's not you know they're not we're not all going to get excited about these games, but they're they're really important to see how players react in that environment because no matter who you're playing, there is a step up in pace and, and intensity to the to, to test matches, and um, it's a great opportunity for some of the young players and someone like Gavin Coombs. I think um, he'll be named today, and and I think he's someone that's uh, you know has a big future ahead of himself as an international, not just as a, as a Munster player or a provincial player. I think he's, he's shown and proved this year that his game has improved all the time. And I love his intelligence. I think he's a real eye for, for the try line. You know, he's 15 tries and in, in 17 starts this year. Um, four of them came at, at the weekend against Zebra on Friday night, but he's just a try machine. And I think he's, he's a really, really intelligent player. And, what he brings is a is a, a huge physicality. He's six foot five. Um, he's a hundred, you know, north of one hundred and fifteen kilos. Um, he's very very powerful, and uh, you know he's going to get better and better all the time. And you know, rugby intelligence is is something that um, he's not spoken a lot about. Um, you know, I, I always think back to Anthony Foley when I played with him. Axel was probably the most intelligent player I ever played with. Um, you know, he wasn't he wasn't blessed with speed or or athleticism. Um, but he was incredibly intelligent. He was a very good footballer, don't get me wrong. Uh, but you know, we used to slag Axel about not not uh, you know not having the speed and the pace of, of other people and he he got a great kick out of that. But he just had this intelligence to turn up at the right places and get his hands on the ball, score lots of tries for Ireland and Munster. And Gavin Coombs reminds me of Axel. Um, he's 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 very athletic and very, very powerful. And he's your modern day back row who's really explosive as well. And we saw the pace at the, on Friday night of him. But um, I'd be incredibly excited about, you know, with Stander gone. Um, from an Ireland point of view, I just think you get Doris and Coombs on, on, on the one in the one back row. Then you have Jack Conan, who's playing so well. Um, you know, obviously he'll have a say there about uh, you know holding on to his Irish place and keeping hold of it. But I just think the two those two guys, Doris and Coombs, are just incredibly athletic, powerful, intelligent, explosive. Um, they're the full package. I think it's just down to themselves now mentally if they can stay stay strong and, and avoid injuries and get a run. They can be really, really serious players for Ireland. Yeah, really looking forward to seeing them team up and probably sooner rather than later as well. Alan, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Alan Quillen giving us some thoughts on the Ireland squad that's going to be named today and the fact that Ronan Kelleher is obviously that close to Lions selection that he has been called up and will be in the Isle of Man training with the Lions. More Lions stuff uh, coming your way across all OTB channels in the coming days and weeks. OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. It is 19 minutes past nine. We, you, you've waltzed in here this morning, Joe, with this air of positivity about you, which 
as viewers of the show know, is, is very, very unusual indeed. Quite the week off you must have had. It must I got said. vaccinated. You, uh, there you go. Congratulations. I got vaccinated. That, that, that explains everything. So you've basically um, outed yourself as somebody who supports this new Euros format, who, who's, who's all for this. Michel Platini, what a genius. Yeah. Un underrated football administrator. On both fronts, not only are you supporting the 11 cities who have uh, claimed to be host cities, you're supporting the fact that we will have this preamble of knocking six teams out, eight teams out over the course of, what is it, 12 days of, of action. This, this, is, this, is, this is very unlike you, I would have thought that this, this is, is per, per ripe for picking for you to, to criticise. Well, I, I, I hold my hands up and say that I was 100% against the idea of having the Euros in loads of different countries, based primarily off the fact that I'd been to Germany for the World Cup in 06 and they did an incredible job in hosting the tournament and it really felt like the football took over the whole country and obviously Germany football mad country and they felt like that was the beginning of a team and Klinsmann was in charge and you could see how having one country have it or it be shared by two smaller countries was a really good idea and look I think they're probably going to go ahead with that the next time around as well but it does look cool it is brilliant that loads of different places are experiencing the Euros, that teams are based in different countries, that they're all going to come together slowly as the tournament progresses, and that the whole continent feels like it's engaged in watching and partaking in football. Imagine what it would be like if everybody was allowed to be on the streets and there were the big screens up in uh, town and, and, uh, towns and city centres, and like what a festival, what a pan-European love parade that would be. Right? What? What? Could? How could anybody actually be against that now that we've seen that it makes a little bit of sense? It makes a lot of sense, right? Well, like, what, what, what have we seen? We've seen, we've seen games in different parts of the world, like yeah. where everybody gets a bit of a home game. Loads of teams get a bit of a home game on the basis of the fact that they've qualified. And I just think, it, like, I was against it, and now I'm. I've decided I've changed my mind. New information came to light. But what's the new? The eleven different. The eleven different cities really bring the room together. How though? Like I, I think that the continent feels part of the Euros because there's really good football on display, and I think you would be feeling the exact same thing if this was in one. Why country. do we need games in St James's Park and Villa Park? Like we actually didn't. It turns out it was much better having games in Baku and Amsterdam, and it turns out this was a good idea. That's all I'm saying. As for the bloated tournament, like what a disaster that the good people of Macedonia got to watch their team <laughs> play in the tournament. Heaven forbid that the Austrians should feel good about the fact that they, they get a game here. Like, no, no, what, no, what's wrong with the a uh, few extra teams? I'm saying bloated further. I'm saying I'm saying go to 32. I'm saying no, this is the halfway no house. Same. If you're, if you're going to have a last 16, then you need you need to have a 32 to get to a last 16. Well, you, can't, you can't go from 24 to 16. It's this is nonsense. Like I mean, last night was really enjoyable. The best not, best game of the tournament so far, and we'll be doing well to see a better game. Still, there was this tinge of. Both of these teams are going to be fine. You need jeopardy, you need stakes for these games to be truly enjoyable. And you'll, in fairness, you'll get a bit of jeopardy now today with uh, Czech Republic and Scotland. And he had a bit of jeopardy yesterday with North Macedonia against Austria because he knew that if North Macedonia lost, chances are they'd be out of the tournament. But there's no real jeopardy. Real jeopardy would be like seeing Croatia having to pay the consequences of losing to England yesterday. Uh, they probably won't. I mean, they might. They might, but like, I mean, they possibly, if that was a World Cup, if there was, like, if they, then it will be of a of far greater consequence than the defeat yesterday. It does, it does kind of not ruin things, but it, it doesn't it, ruin it, things it at all. It doesn't. It, it this is like your this is a football a hipster argument of like I yeah I need my zeros and ones to make perfect sense, and they just don't. For a little for a little while, there's going to be a little bit of massaging of things, and most teams are going to get through, and we'll get a little bit more extra football, and loads of countries will feel the joy of having been at a European tournament, and we'll all move on. And we'll forget about this in two weeks' time, when the quarterfinals will have all the best teams in it, who played a good bit of football, and actually are playing into some form and hopefully their best selections. And, and all that stuff can still be true while also having a group stage that is a, a little bit more precarious. So you just want 32 teams instead of 24? Yeah, exactly. No, I don't disagree well with that. May as well go to whole hog. May, Are we agreeing here? Is that what's happening? May, may as well go to whole hog, get 32 in. Obviously that means that the Republic of Ireland will qualify for more tournaments than, than they won't qualify for. But uh, if, Ooh, if, if, if we're, look, we're at this halfway house here, where it's like, we've got a last 16 going on that we want to Do you want us all to go back to like going to Poland or going to... Yeah. You do? I do, or at, or at least some sort of, I would like, I, I think general rule of thumb is 
a very short flight or a train should be able to get you from one venue to another. Baku to Glasgow is just too big. It's too big a... Okay, a but you could easily make it so that there's like a conference in that part of Europe and a conference in this part of Europe and a conference in this part of Europe and those are the all the way through to like the quarterfinals. Is that y like... Like, I mean, absolutely, like, I mean, I guess if it was, like, uh, Athens, Istanbul, Baku uh, as your, your three main cities in, in a sort of southeast Europe yeah. slash Asia sort And we of could thing. be based there. Like, you, you know, it's not, it's not just the, the countries from that region who end up there, but that's, that's, that would be, like, if, if you're not getting home games, then you're away and you're based in one of those places. I, I'm fine with that. Like... Yeah, I, I, I also do think though, I, I, okay, so you'd know better, I haven't been to a World Cup, but I, I would suspect that one of the great parts of, the, parts of the World Cup is happening upon other supporters that have nothing to do with you. So I, like I'd say it was this, the case in Moscow, certainly because they had two stadiums in use in 2018, where you're like, the, there is just a, this petri dish of all these different nationalities in, in one city, which is, which is a brilliant thing, or, or if there are cities in close proximity, yeah. whereas there's no spillover whatsoever. There, there's no, um, well, one city isn't infecting another here with, an, with their, their, their case of enthusiasm. You say that, but uh, like in Ireland, for example, where we have so many fans from uh, different countries who live here all the time, them suddenly coming out of the woodwork and taking over the city is actually an amazing thing. And I think we're probably going to see a bit of that as time goes on and, and uh, there's an opening up over the next couple of weeks in Ireland that the, the, the Polish fans in Ireland, for example, and uh, the, I don't know, some other countries. Everyone you know, would be great. Like, yeah, we're, like uh, the English fans will, will make themselves known, I'm sure. And like that, I think that would happen a good bit more as the, I, look, One, let's have a proper tournament where we're all allowed to travel and can go and pick games and see what it's like having 11 cities and everybody coming over to Dublin to watch their teams play and hopefully us. I'd like that. I agree with that. I, I actually do want to see this format in, in like normal, normal times, times and see what it, see what it's like because it's unfair to judge it. But my, my initial opinion is maybe it's it's not the way to go. Right. Well, it's okay. You can be wrong once. OTB AM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Time for turn our attention to tennis. Colin Buig is with us. Colin. The way we morning, do this Jeff. is we've got a uh, fifteen love slot, a thirty love slot, a uh, forty love slot, and a game set and championship point. Turns out. Uh, this weekend, this Monday. How are you, Colm? Not too bad yourself, sir. Are you reeling after Novak Djokovic's latest success? Yeah, I, heard, I am. I heard you earlier. I'm sick. I heard you earlier. I thought it was harsh. I thought it was harsh. I heard you at the very top of the show this morning saying, was it sometimes evil triumphs? Yeah. I mean, come on. Like, whatever you think of Djokovic, sir, and I actually I know well what you think of him, but whatever people think of him in general, like, the statistics don't lie for Djokovic's latest achievement. That's, he's the first player since Rod Laver in 1969 to win all four Grand Slams at least twice. He's the first player in 72 years to recover from two sets down twice at the same Grand Slam and win it. Of course, he's on course now for a Golden Grand Slam. He's never recovered from two sets down in any of his 29 previous Grand Slam finals. And most importantly, lads, he's on 19 Grand Slams now, which is just one behind Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer, which means Wimbledon, which starts in two weeks' time, is going to be very exciting. By the... Year. Um, and what I'm sorry, what I'm very interested to see, if he does go and win Wimbledon, which he's by far the favourite to do, I wonder will Federer and Nadal tweet him congratulations, just like Federer tweeted Nadal congratulations last October when Nadal equaled his 20 hall. Well, I'm sure their media teams will, will definitely send out the required response. So what you're telling me is Novak Djokovic is on the verge of becoming the new Margaret Court. Oh, uh, statistically, sick. yes. Statistically, yeah. If you just look at his CV for trophies, and I won't comment any further on what you've been there, but he is on course to become the greatest. And I, we had actually the three of us. What a what a thing. what a great tournament or champions breakfast that would be. Whatever it is, the the dance that they have uh, after after Wimbledon, where they all show up and dance together. Margaret Court and Novak Djokovic together at last. The three of us had this debate the morning after the French Open final last year. It was out of the big three who was going to be the greatest. And uh, you could easily vouch for all three in different ways. Easily, all three. I mean, Federer, you could say, is the most naturally talented. Nadal is the most dominant of any single discipline in, in any sports person in history. Maybe Floyd Mayweather's defensive game in boxing, I don't know. Possibly there are other examples, but Nadal and, and, French, and French Open clay, up until Friday night, you would say, oh, it's a sure thing. And then Djokovic is just the best all-rounder, which is the stat I started with, that he's won all four Grand Slams at least twice. So there are arguments for all of them, and we're in this um, brilliant era that we'll probably never get again. I mean, you could say one argument you would definitely make is that 
the three best players of all time are playing at the same time. Conor, you, you described Novak Djokovic there as the best all-rounder, which says to me that he is the best at tennis, which says to me that he is the greatest of all time. And can we not just get to that point of accepting that sometimes the bad guy is the best? I get why people prefer Nadal and Federer because they are less of a dickhead than Novak Djokovic is. I get that. But we do have to separate the, what, yeah. the, the, the man from the achievement. And this guy will, more than likely call him, surpass the 20. He won't just reach the 20. He'll probably surpass the 20. He will, he will go above the two boys having had to break that duopoly that existed in the sport to come in and break up the Nadal and Federer control on the sport and then to overtake them. He, like, I, I just can't see a world in which you can make an argument against that being the greatest of all time if he surpasses them, which I think will happen. So this sort of thing of, is he the best all-rounder of all time? Is that just a cop-out? Is that just a way of not whoa, saying whoa, he's the best ever? Whoa. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm qualifying all three. I mean, yeah, you're right. First of all, you have to separate the man from the art. But, I mean, what Who has really the man Who really cares about that? the Australian Open anyway, Owen? Like, come what, on. What, and that's what, the thing. Like, it was never... Cares what, about the Australian what, what, Open. It was never really <laughs> considered the, on a par with Jeez. the other three. They invented this Shouting fourth one it. for, like, come on. What, um, I mean, come on, lads. I mean, what's he really done that that's bad? Okay, his anti-vaccination stance, the US Open incident last year. He's definitely the least likable out of the three. Having well, a party was, in the middle of uh, organising yeah, yeah. a, a yeah, super so, spreader yeah. event. What a party it was. Totally. Totally, but I mean, in the grand scheme of evil famous people, he's way down the list. Yeah. I mean, um, and, and also, like, I had this debate with, I think, Adrian Barry. Uh, <laughs> that's not a great, that's week. like, he's, that's not really <laughs> a great, the middle that's of not last quite week, the winning right? argument you think hold it on is there, there, Colin. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I had a debate with Adrian in the middle of last week, and I was saying, uh, because Djokovic went mental after his quarterfinal win against Matteo Berrettini, he was shouting at his box, just unhinged. And I was saying to Adrian, why doesn't he just embrace this side of his personality? Why doesn't he play the bad guy? Why doesn't he play, in wrestling terms, the heel? Because you are not going to surpass Nadal and Federer in terms of love. You never will. And there's an argument to say that Djokovic really wants to be loved. Now, by all accounts, he's quite a popular dressing room player, but it doesn't transcend to the, to the public opinion of him, uh, especially in the last year or two, which, you know, his PR has just been a nightmare. Because up until that point, he was just the least favourite out of the three, but now he's giving people reasons to dislike him actively. Um, I don't mind it so much. I don't really care about any of the bad things he's done that much because I just love watching him play. Um, and that that semi-final against Nadal on Friday night, I mean, Sunday's final against Tsitsipas, Stefano Tsitsipas, was brilliant as well. I mean, Tsitsipas raced into a two-set lead and he actually revealed afterwards on Instagram that he found out five minutes before he took the Philip Chatteret that his grandmother had passed away. His, um, his father's mother, who was his coach, who was in the stand as well. So for him to to go out and perform like that in the first two sets, and especially the second set where he blew Djokovic away, uh, was incredibly admirable. But Djokovic took a break, went back, came back out, changed clothes, and was just a different player, just like he was in the fourth round against Lo uh, Lorenzo Mazzetti when he was two sets down and went and got changed and came back a different player. But the thing with Djokovic is he's not afraid of five sets. He's not afraid of going the distance. No. And that's the most intimidating no. aspect. His, play against them. his physical prowess is really very impressive. So that's uh, our 15 love point is Djokovic creates history twice in one match to win his 19th Grand Slam. What was the what was the second bit of history? Come that was the first time he's come from two sets down or what was Yeah, the... yeah, no, I, I was naming the history at the start there, which is the big the big two stats, the Rod Laver comparison. I mean, the four Grand Slams twice. Right, uh, is incredible, and also the the fact that he's come from two sets down. Yeah, the first pair to come from two sets down twice in the same Grand Slam. Because he looked very tired in the first two sets and then he didn't look tired in the rest of the game. Yeah, but he, he does, he's done that so many times. He did it against Mazzetti. I mean, he, um, he was tired against Nadal and he beat him in four sets. You know, he just has this knack of, uh, of performing when it really matters and he can be up against it and he has confidence in his own body and his own talent that uh, when he's in a losing position, he doesn't panic. He does not panic. And he had Nadal panicking at the French Open, probably for the first time. I mean, you have to realise, I mean, Nadal's record at the French Open, I know you can only lose once every year, so the idea that he's only lost three times, you know, it's a caveat, because you can only lose once. Well, but yeah. since he made his debut in 2005, like, he lost to Robin Soderling in 2009 in the fourth round. And Soderling went to the final and lost to Federer. He lost to Djokovic in 2015 in the quarterfinal. And Djokovic lost that final to Stan Mavrinka. The following year, Djokovic won the French Open when Nadal pulled out in the early round, rounds through injury. Uh, Djokovic beat Andy Murray in that final. So this was really the first time 
where a top, not, not quite 100% Nadal, but an extremely good Nadal was beaten by the better man. Because in 2015, Nadal was way out of form. He had completely lost his confidence. And in 2009, he was basically a child and Soderling beat him in a one-off. But Djokovic against Nadal, it was up there. I, I was tweeting about it. I think everybody was. That it was up there with the 2008 Wimbledon final between Federer and Nadal in terms of watching two greats playing great at the same time. And I know it, it was coinciding with the first Euros game, but, you know, according to Twitter and my WhatsApp, you know, just popping like there was people texting all over the place saying, this is just remarkable. This is monumental stuff. And the thing about tennis, I would always say to people is you'll get this five match every four or five years where even if you have no interest in the sport, it's so compelling to watch two players like that go at it because you don't know what's going to happen. That third set on Friday night is, is Hall of Fame territory. It's marked off already. OK, so your prediction is that Djokovic is going to end up with the most Grand Slams? Oh, you just do the maths. I mean, he's the youngest. He's 34 to Nadal's 35. Federer's 40 in August. If you want another one, you'd be doing very well. Djokovic is, every year, is the favourite for three of the four slams. And now he just beat the best at the other slam that he's not favoured for. Yeah. So if you do the maths, he's, he, he could easily surpass Nadal and Federer. It doesn't mean that he's the best ever for everybody. I mean, I have my own opinion. Some, like, other people have their others, as I say. All three you can make you can make a serious case for, and you wouldn't be wrong. You wouldn't be wrong with picking any of the three, except um, Djokovic, obviously. And I then uh, really right our, our match point today is the uh, the women's winner. The correct pronunciation of her surname? Uh, Krachikova. Krachikova. Barbara Krachikova. Yeah, unbelievable lads. I was um, I was I was writing about it over the weekend for OTDSports.com. This you know. Her CV, 25 years of age, a complete unknown. This is only her fifth ever Grand Slam singles entry. She's never played Wimbledon singles. She probably will in two weeks' time. And she wins the French Open uh, with a really good performance against Anastasia Pavlyuchenko on Saturday. But not just that, she's also a three-time Grand Slam doubles winner and a three-time Grand Slam mixed doubles winner. In fact, she won on Sunday in the doubles. Uh, and with that becomes the first player since Mary Pierce in 2000 to win the singles and doubles in the same year at Roland Garros. She's a remarkable person, uh, was coached by the late great Yana Novotna, the 1998 Wimbledon champion. Um, she realised, uh, as an 18-year-old Krachikova, that Novotna lived in a town beside her in the Czech Republic. So she and her parents called Novotna's house, armed with a letter that Krachikova wrote asking for Novotna for advice on how to make the most of a burgeoning tennis career. And Novotna said, let's, let's rally, let's hit a few shots, see what you're like. And uh, Novotna said, yeah, we'll take it from there. And she coached her for a few years. And of course, Nevada, Nevada very sadly passed away from cancer in late 2017. And uh, one of the last things she said to Kachikova was, you know, try to enjoy tennis. And if you can, win a Grand Slam. And then less than a year later, she won the French Open doubles and Wimbledon doubles. And then three years later, she's won the French Open singles. And now she's won the same amount of Grand Slam singles championships as her great here in Nevada. It's a remarkable story. Barely anybody knows her, which is mad. Good enough with the, in terms of the quality of her game to win at Wimbledon and the US Open, is it, or is it a clay court game exclusively, do you think? Clay court, really. I mean, she, it's her perfect surface. As I said, she's never played Wimbledon singles before, ever. So who knows what's going to happen in a couple of weeks. You'd imagine that she's, uh, the adrenaline will finally wear off now after that remarkable achievement over the weekend. Um, like, she only won her very first singles title in the warm-up event before Roland Garros. She won the Strasbourg Open the day before the French Open started this year and not annihilated with that, it's, you know, yeah. nobody knew who this person was. So, it, you know, whatever she does now, it's still a great achievement, but she's only 25, and uh, she's not afraid by the fact that she is not that well-known. So it, it could serve her well. All right, you know? Colm, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, lads. That was our match point there. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We'll obviously be talking to Colm in more detail around Wimbledon as well. If you have thoughts on that, you could uh, get them into us on WhatsApp 0879-180-180. It's been a particularly good morning for Wayne Ryan, who's won our Gillette starter pack. Wayne got in touch and sent us his picks for the performance rankings. The great Wicklow beating the Ulster champions, not getting any credit as usual, as it's all about poor Cavan. Djokovic in the green beating Nadal and then winning the final to win the French Open. The bad was France about to blow up, losing all bets that people were cashing out. And England, no Grealish, another Latisse. Uh, join us tomorrow morning from half seven. We're talking Euro 2020 with Graham Hunters, both Scotland and Spain play their opening matches this morning. We'll also speak with Ireland and Lions star Robbie Henshaw and there's much more besides as well. Right now we're bringing you more reaction to the weekend sport. We're going to hear from Austin O'Malley at Mayo Clare in a few moments but first here's Jim Blake with Ashley O'Reilly in Clonus.
Dermot, what a game here today. 121 to 217. It's Monaghan who will stay in Division 1. What do you make of the game? Yeah, what a tonic to leading into the championship there. Um, I, Mon Monaghan will be absolutely uh, over the moon with that performance. I mean, they were dead and bur buried with five minutes to go in the game and they came back. And probably, you know, they were the one team that looked like they were going to win in extra time. You know, their old guard stepped up to the plate uh, and saw them over the line. But what a game. They they got a standing ovation by their small fans here after the game. They they wait around till the team come out again. Fantastic game. 100 minutes of high intensity football. I can't get better than that. We'll talk about the first half. So it was Galway who led by three at the break. They very much looked like they were they were on top then. Yeah, they were. You know, they were, their game plan was working well. They were counter-attacking. They were creating a lot of goal chances. You know, there was a huge scoring on both sides. But I'd also say that there was a lot of chances missed. There was a lot of goal chances. Both goalkeepers were very busy. And uh, Galway can be very happy with that as, as well as Monaghan. But I suppose the guile of the older guys for Monaghan probably saw them through... Um, Paul Connery got a black card about five minutes to go in the game and Monaghan ju just took over then and um, you know Jack McCarran what a performance he actually only came on uh, in uh, just at the water break in the first half so he missed 50 minutes of the game and he still ended up with 7.6 from play unbelievable worms and all the scores were from far out the, on the on the sidelines and brilliant scoring so what a performance for him Absolutely, and they were big scores, weren't they? I was actually speaking to the manager there, um, David from Monaghan, after the game, and he said he's absolutely delighted for Jack just because he's really been through the ringer, a lot of injuries, and he couldn't get over his performance here today. He was just delighted for him. Yeah, himself and Darren Hughes, and you know, and Darren came on and he actually got a black card as well, so he missed him minutes of that game, and um, he was fantastic. He really bossed the game, he controlled the game. Conor McManus wasn't as influential as he usually is, but he still got some vital scores, so you know, it was still. Still the old guard, the experienced players that saw them over the line, but they do have some very energetic uh, footballers out there. There's a lot of energy. You know, they were they were still going well in, in the hundred minute. They were the uh, team attacking. So, you know, I'm sure Banty and Donny Buckley and the uh, and the management team would be very very pleased with that going into the championship. Absolutely. And just speaking on Conor McManus, I was watching him just before the first of the, se the second half, just before the break, as it went into extra time. And he was waiting and waiting, waiting for his opportunity. You know, that experience really showed. And you could see when he got it, he had no other plan than putting that over the bar. He's not afraid of taking them pressurised kicks. Yeah, but that that's the experience, I suppose, that Mon had had and Galway didn't. Galway were very wasteful when they were five points up, they had a few chances to kill the game off and they didn't do it. That just comes with experience. Conor Mc Man, it's, it's very funny. He just hovers around. He waits for that opportunity. But what a raider he has. He rarely misses a, a shot. But on the other side, Jack McCarran did it as well for that to, to, to win it by a point. What a score that was. You know, on the 45 under pressure, he slotted it straight over the bar. So, you know, the forward line is moving well for Monaghan. And, and in general, they seem to develop their style of play over this league. You know, they, they're, they're not as reliant on Conor McManus as they were. And they're still, you know, very competitive and winning games. So, you know, they're in good stead going into the, the Fermanagh game in a few weeks time. And just speaking on relying on Conor McManus, is that what happened with Galway? Are we relying on Shane Walsh? Is that is that what happened here today? Well, to be honest with you, I think that today Shane had one of his quieter games. He was double marked there for a while. So and Galway still had the game nearly out, out of reach, but didn't see it off. You know, in fairness to Park, he's brought an lot of young lads through there. Uh, you know, in COVID, they haven't got many t many games, so he's blooded a lot of players and these guys will gain from that experience I know it's very disappointing going down to a uh, division uh, going down a division but like at the end of the day we're playing Roscommon uh, or Galway playing Roscommon in a few weeks time that's the big game for Pork and his, and, and his team and when they dust down and, and get over the disappointed they've had um, 100 minutes of high intensity football they've blooded a lot of young players over, tr through these 3 or 4 games and a lot of them have come up trumps so they'll be going into Roscommon game full of, full of energy as well you know Porrick Joyce, you've played with him many years. He was very upset after the game and of course only so, but he didn't come out, he didn't speak to the media. Um, what do you think? He's just very disappointed? Yeah, that's Porrick. He, you know, he's a very, very confident player and you know, always wanted to win as a player and the same way as a management manager, he you know, he wants to win all the time. And you know, I think himself he knew if the, if, the, if there was the likes of Porrick Joyce out there with ten or fifty minutes to go, that game would have been over. And it's, that's probably the most frustrating thing for him when you play well, really well and lose. 
but on Porrick's you know when Porrick looks back at the video and, and looks at that game he's in an awful lot better situation than he was after getting the, the, the drabbing down in uh, Killarney against Kerry like at that stage you know things were looking very bad now at least we put in a huge performance blooded a lot of players didn't pick up any injuries and we're going to Roscommon with kind of a small pep in our step Absolutely, and looking ahead to that championship, they did have not a bad league campaign. You know, it was tough against Kerry. They had a good win against Roscommon. Then against Dublin, it was only four points against the All-Ireland champions. There is a lot of positives here. Yeah, and if you look at the back line that Galway have there, and it's kind of been our Ackley's heel for a long time, but a lot of these players now have marked quality players in this league, top quality players. They won't mark as good of players as them ever. That's the standard, that you can't get much better than the players they've marked over the while. And they've came, they've came up OK, They've learned a lot from it. So for a young team, they'll, they'll come on an awful, an awful lot from that. So, you know, they just need to kind of build on it now and really focus in, you know, dust down and get ready for us coming. And what about championship? How do you think they'll go in championship? Is Roscommon the big game if they win that? Yeah, it's all about the Roscommon game now. You can't look any further. Roscommon are a fantastic team. You know, they have, they, they, they seem to have got the advantage over Galway in the last few years. And I suppose always historically they've been very good. Even in 1998 when Galway won the All-Ireland, Roscommon brought them to extra time. Anthony Cunney and McGolleman is over Roscommon. I'm sure he'll have, he'll have spies in at Pier Stadium watching, us tra- watching Galway train for the next few weeks. He'll know us inside out. So it's going to be a fantastic game. That Roscommon team have a lot of good players too. Um, you know, they're a Division 1 team. So Galway and Roscommon and Mayo, that's a very competitive uh, Connacht Championship. Absolutely. And Monaghan now are going in in a high against Fermanagh in three weeks' time. Yeah, and they're on the good side of the draw. Like, you know, what a, what a tonic for the championship for these guys now. You know, they'll be bouncing a train and everyone will be trying to get back uh, to play. They're, they're playing Monaghan or playing Fermanagh. That'll be a tough, tough uh, game. But you would think that this kind of victory will get them over that game. And they're not meeting uh, Don- Donegal or Tyrone. They're on the other side of the draw. So they could potentially get to a... Um, Ulster final and if they get to there who knows but the Banty and his management team Donny Buckley is, o- is only his first year in you can see the stamp that he's put on the team they're playing more kind of an attacking style energetic game so um, they'll be delighted w- w- with the performance and uh, you know who knows where, where it'll end for them this year and just speaking on their style there for a minute Rory Began he has his own style he's playing up there in full forward at one stage constantly in the other half of the pitch you wouldn't want to be nervous seeing him running up no and there was one stage there he was actually tackling Conor Gleeson coming out with the ball he fouled him I've never seen that before a goalie tackling a goalie in play <laughs> and uh, but on the other side he nearly got lobbed when um, when Indo Tierney took a shot and it hit yeah. the crossbar so but he, it's fantastic he's he's really been uh, you know changing up the game how goal to keep his play coming out the field I'm sure all the young goalkeepers down across the country are doing this at underage just seeing Rory Began do this He's a fanta- he actually missed two 45s today which is not like him but he's such an influential player and if you look at Monaghan the big players for Monaghan are all the most more experienced players and they're still there doing it uh, for, for 10 years and they'll do it this year so you know it's very good for Monaghan and Dermot, we were talking just walking in. There was a little buzz today. There was people here, supporters. It was nice, wasn't it? Yeah, fantastic. You know, it's summer days, dry, dry sod. Uh, both teams very fit. No experiments going on. Everyone playing their full team, you know, playing their systems that they're going to play in championship. High intensity stuff. Um, fantastic to see it. You know, there was only 500 people here, but it sounded like there was 10,000 here with the way they were shouting. The, the uh, supporters uh, clapping the man and team off. Brilliant to see that and uh, hopefully we can get more crowds back and roll on the championship. Brilliant Dermot, thank you. Thanks very much. Austin O'Malley, we're here in Cusick Park in Ennis and Mayo have our promotion back to Division 1 of the National Football League with a four point win over Clare. What are the early thoughts after watching that? How will James Horn feel? Yeah, I suppose there'll be a little bit of disappointment, particularly around the performance in the second half there. You know, we did have the break 11 up, came out and we conceded heavy in that second half. Um, we ran our bench, we got a little bit disjointed, things looked a little bit, you know, fragmented there in the second half. Didn't use the ball probably particularly as well as we'd have liked to. But I do think probably, you know, the, the, the withdrawal of Killian O'Connor with that injury certainly affected our rhythm uh, up front and also we lacked that little bit of leadership and that little bit of edge um, so I, I think that would be a concern uh, after the game and the amount of space that we probably left um, you know to Clare to profit there and they did they, they pilfered quite heavily there 2-10 in that second half so that would be a concern coming out of here but overall I suppose job done four point uh, victory and, it's, and, and you're, you're back up to division one which would probably have been the end goal you know 
In terms of the Killian O'Connor injury, we saw him hobbling off here just before half time, making his way along the end line. How worried will Horn be about that? Yeah, look, you're always worried, I suppose, you know, if a player picks up a, uh, what looked to be maybe like a significant injury. Who knows, though, yeah, yeah. But he did look to, to, he was in, you know, quite a lot of discomfort when he left the pitch. And that will be a worry because we've seen the imprint that he left on the game up to that in terms of his penalty, the way he dispatched it. And also, you know, the scores that he had kicked prior to that. And he's, you know, he's a marquee forward. So any day, you, you, you know, that a guy like that picks up an injury, it is a concern. And he's a massive, massive presence. And he's, the leadership ability he brings to that team as well is, 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 um, is second to none. You know. We'll come back to Clare's comeback in a moment, but Mayo took over in the 10th minute and they looked exceptional for about 25, 25 minutes of that, second, of that first half. What did, it, what did it get right? I think just what they got right was their, their patience, their control, the way they moved the ball. They got the right people on the end of the ball at the right time. And we just looked like we were able to, to dictate the tempo and the pace of things and score at will. Um, I think we worked you know, a lot of beautiful combinations, even for that goal for Oshin Mullen, in terms of when we had that lovely sort of interchange between Lee Keek and Tommy Conroy and a little pop back out into McGinn. So we were working those lovely little combinations. We were dominant in the middle of the field as well, in particular Aidan O'Shea. Was, was securing a lot of primary ball and we looked like we were able to pin Claire in at that stage. Uh, so that, that, that all looked good and, and we were in, you know, we were in control um, up to the break, certainly. Aidan O'Shea's first half performance would definitely be a positive for Horn. He, Mayo claimed 50% of Claire's kickouts in the first half, but it was zero in the second half. First of all, what were Mayo doing so right? How did they get them under so much pressure? Yeah, they looked like they, they kind of went zonal and pressed in that first half, without a doubt. And there were a lot of those kickouts came out to, to the, the right hand side under the stand here and that duel that he had with O'Connor you know and he was Mayo were robbing a lot or they were pilfering a lot of ball from those um, they seemed to drop off in the second half and Clare seemed to get a lot of his stuff away quick and out to the, the opposite side so that'll definitely be in terms of when they, they rake over the ashes of the coals uh, or the embers of, 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 of their performance that would be a concern and something they'll have to go after From speaking to David Tuberty shortly after the game uh, he said the physicality and the turnovers from the Mayo team in the first half well, was, a, was a big thing. A lot of their scores came from turnovers. It is that from just from playing Division One football for the last number of years that you're just bigger and stronger? Yeah, I think it is. I think in terms of, you know, it's like a stratified, it's layers of conditioning laid down over the years and it's there in the system. Uh, and Mayo, you know, they press you hard and they, they attack you in the pocket. So they, they are quite robust, particularly around that middle court. They have a lot of, a lot of energy and a lot of industry um, and their physicality, certainly. We've even looked at the likes of the guys of Tommy Conroy this year that he's stacked on a little bit more. So that definitely is there and that probably, you know, Claire did find they're going quite tough there uh, but if, if they have aspirations to go to division one that's that's what's going to greet you up there and that's what you're going to be exposed to so Claire will take a lot from that there today I tell in terms of the way they went about their business and trying to match up to that so it's only why by, by virtue of the fact of you putting yourself in those positions and testing that and feeling that and going no okay well yeah we, there's there's levels you know so Mayo led by 11 points at half time Colm Collins makes two changes at the break Mayo lost Killian O'Connor just before half time what happened I think we dropped off a little bit. I think Podge Collins came in. I thought he added a, a huge amount of value to Clare uh, around the place. Just his movement and where we, he was popping up. Um, O'Connor at midfield as well. I thought he was devastating at times. The way he drove at the heart of Mayo's defence and obviously finished uh, finished the goal there as well. But also Gavin Cooney in the corner. Um, they just seemed to, 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 to come with a lot more energy and industry in the second half. Uh, Mayo looked to be dropped off a bit. As I've said previously, I thought they lacked a little bit of leadership up front in that second half. Um, they took on shots that weren't weren't you know the, the right option and so on and that probably the, a lot of the changes broke the rhythm uh, as well I think you know in terms of that lack of leadership Mayo obviously had a winter where they lost five or six very experienced players in that dressing room and being a castle bar at the Mead Mayo game a couple of weeks ago the fact that Killian O'Connor started was a massive thing for Mayo he really led the way where is Mayo's leadership coming from if Connor isn't there yeah, it's an interesting one. I guess uh, you know you're looking at to, to, you're certainly looking to guys like Lee Keegan. You know, Oshin Mullen has become one of the the our, our four you know our, our sort of our one of more our formidable players at the moment as well. So certainly those two guys, Aidan O'Shea back in the fold today. I thought he, he showed you know an awful lot of leadership at times. There, particularly in the in the closing stages there, where he he looked to dictate the tempo and, and just take the pressure off Mayo by holding on to the ball and talking and orchestrating things. So certainly guys like that. I thought Matty Ruan is another guy that stood up today as well. He 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 did quite a big a big showing, um, and he's been very impressive over the, uh, over uh, the national 
league so far as well. So we're looking to guys like that certainly, and obviously Dermot, we, we lost Dermot O'Connor there early as well. So you know his leadership capability and the mobility that he brings around the field as well um, probably didn't help us when he when he left the field. You know. So Clare of Kerry in less than two weeks' time. What impressed you about Colin Collins' side? I think what impressed me was in the second half, particularly in the way they managed the ball and the way they managed to work space to, to, to create the options for scores. And their kicking was really, really good. Uh, and their energy and industry, it's a pity they hadn't bought a little bit more of that in that second quarter. Um, and you know that would have left them in a far better position. Like they came out of the break eleven down, which is a you know it's a mountain to climb. But what what you know what you do get from Clare is obviously huge spirit, huge uh, you know a huge commitment, and they gave that there in the end. So they they are a nice side in terms of that. They just need to add maybe a little bit more to their 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 middle third and that platform to get to get more ball to to go forward with. When a team has a run in you like Mayo and a team as experienced as Mayo, um, and they're on top. What can you do? What can you do to rattle them or get back in or drag yourself back into the match? Yeah, I think the thing about it is it's all about possession, obviously. And I thought there in the in the first half that Clare probably killed themselves a little bit in terms of they took on a lot of pot shots that a number of them dropped short. They had a couple of poor wides and that. So when you're playing a team like Mayo, you have to manage the ball and you have to hold on to possession and you have to have patience uh, and you have to try and create. When you do get opportunities, you have to try and take them. And goals, and we, we did, we spoke even while it was the game was developing there in the first half, that Mayo were leaving pockets of space in behind there. Uh, and I suppose if Clare were a little bit more, had a little bit more innovation or ingenuity here on the game, they'd have spotted those earlier earlier and, and flashed balls into, in, into people uh, with you know to profit from the, those spaces that were left. But that didn't happen. Uh, and that allowed Mayo then obviously a little bit more front foot football to go, go down the other end and, and cash in. In terms of Mayo's attack, 222 is a good score to post in a Division Two semi-final. They've, they were top scorers across Division Two. They, they had 70 points coming into this game. Well, who impressed you up front? Uh, obviously, I'll say uh, Killian put in a big show while he was there. Um, I thought Aiden dropped in to, to, to full forward at times there as well. Uh, obviously, the former Ryan O'Donoghue is, is very, very pleasing. And Tommy Conroy uh, today as well in terms of what he got on and the way he took his scores and that. So there is a nice little triangle or a nice axis there of kind of Killian, Tommy Conroy and Ryan O'Donoghue. That's, you know, and that's beginning to, to, to become or to, to become well established now and you can see that they're playing in sync with one another and they're getting quite laugh. So that is a nice triangle uh, that Mayo have going up front there. Will Horn be worried about the fact that the, the pace of the games that he's played up to this point have been of a Division Two standard? Yeah, I think it's always a concern, obviously. Uh, you know, particularly there in the first half or in the second half, uh, when when Clare came at us again, we, we, we did struggle at times uh, to, to shut them down and close them out. And obviously, if that was a Kerry or a, or a Dublin or a Donegal, um, you know, the energy and the intensity that they bring would be far far greater than that. So you would be slightly worried about that, without a doubt, in terms of you know the exposure that you're going to meet late, later on, and in terms of what those teams have been exposed to in Division One. Yeah, it is a concern, particularly when you have a lot of younger guys that, that uh, on a bench that haven't been exposed to that sort of altitude of Division One football or, or, or senior championship. You're a Mayo man, but you obviously had a stint playing with Wicklow. That's right. Can I ask you about uh, Davy Burkside's win against Cavan yesterday? So they relegated Cavan to Division Four, the reigning Ulster champions, and they've retained their place in Division Three. Yeah, no, listen, great to see it in, in, in many respects. I really enjoyed my time down there. There's a great, uh, you know, natural spirit in Wicklow football and they, you know, they've been known to do that in the past in, in terms of that they can really pull a, a performance out of, some would say, nowhere, but there's an awful lot of quality footballers in Wicklow and they've got an excellent manager in Davey, like, and I'm not at all surprised they've done that. And um, They got in and they, 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 I think they you know, they, they got their goals and they managed the game really well after that. Cavan will obviously be very disappointed uh, to drop down to four, particularly after the year they had last year and win in Ulster um, so they have a bit of work to do to get back up there it's a tough place to come back up out of uh, but for all, you know, all credit to, to Wicklow I thought they were fantastic and full value for their win How much did league football correlate with championship when you started off your career was it as important say a summer like this when the league is only a couple of weeks away from championship it's clear how important it is yeah. but back when you kicked off yeah no I always thought it was really important I think particularly when I started off I knew like you know you you really got a sense and a feel of where you were, I suppose, form-wise, but also being able to, to test and match yourself physically and mentally out there in those games. So that's why I think even from a Mayo perspective to, that us to get back up to Division 1 is so, so important because we have an awful lot of young guys that need to be exposed 
to that altitude, that need to be on a bus going to Healy Park in Oma, that need to be going to 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 to, to Fitzgerald Stadium or up to Bally Buffet. And that's really where you sharpen your axe and you learn an awful lot about yourself as well from a confidence perspective as well. And psychologically, it kind of gives you that, um, I suppose, that energy that, yeah, you, you, you are able to cut it at that level. So it is hugely, league, league football is hugely important. Kerry looked awesome again yesterday. They've turned it on a few times in the league. How would you feel about Colin Collins' care side heading down there in 13 days' time? Yeah, you would have a slight worry for them in, 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 in some respects, particularly maybe what we've seen in the in the first half. You know, if they have those zone outs for 15, uh, you know, for 15 minutes or so, that could really, really hurt you, particularly against the quality that Kerry, Kerry have. Um, you know, they can really gut you out. and They can score in, in very heavily in those type of blocks. So you will be worried about that. But on the flip of that, is you know, today's game will serve them in good stead because they've played a team that, look, they are a Division One side, Mayo. So they've, they've got up close and personal with them. You know, they've taken an awful lot of, um, they've taken an awful lot of energy and, and, and I suppose, hope from that last, that, that, that second half. And, it's, you know, they finished the half quite strong. Um, so they, they'll be, they, they'll, you know, they'll be going to, 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 to Kerry with a, with a lot of confidence as well um, but be under no illusions that this Kerry team are in awesome form at the moment you know and if you give them a chance they will literally they will hose you you know Austin O'Malley thanks very much thanks very much Sean what's that thing going round